Satanic uh, abuse and, and, and satanic worship goes on, not just with the white and upper class is of the of the country in these stately manor homes. It's been goes on in all sorts of cultures. I dealt with it first when I was in the police. I dealt, dealt with a thing called Opia, OPEA, which is a, a version of voodoo. And what is really strange is it's the same gods that are worshipped. So you you know there there is like these nine realms of demons and they're worshipped all throughout the world. They're just given different names. Because when you take a virgin blood, that's like a DNA, right? And then when you take it and you go and give it to the water spirit, what you're actually doing is my DNA is actually linked with the demon. So wherever I go in the world, taking you to England to go and work, and then they'll think that they come in here to work, but guess what? There's a madame waiting for them. They'll take their passports away and then they'll, you know, they have to go into the sex a trade and then the madame will say, this is how much you need to pay me. Men will tell you, dog dear, I'm a witch. And they'll tell you how many demons that is inside them. The demon in her, attracting evil people, evil men, occultic men, demonic men. What is in her? Seeing bad people, the energy, what they call it energy, like a magnet. Can we see that fire again? Before the podcast, a word from our sponsor, Surfshark. I'm using my Surfshark VPN right now. I can watch Netflix stuff that's banned in the UK. Running a YouTube channel, dealing with all kinds of true crime characters. I've learned a lot about criminal activity. But there's a type of crime that people don't really talk about. I'm talking about cybercrime, and anybody can be a victim. If you use a device on a public Wi-Fi network, your data is up for grabs from hackers. I was hacked like crazy a couple of years ago, and that's why I know we've all got to be savvy when it comes to cybercrime and fraud. If you subscribe to Surfshark, you know that experts in online security are protecting you at all times. This added security comes from something called a VPN, Virtual Private Network. This means if you are a Surfshark subscriber, every time you surf the net, your privacy is protected. If you want to support what we're doing on this channel, check out the link at the bottom of the screen, put in the special code Sean, S-H-A-U-N, and you will get 83% off your first three months subscription. Quite good. Oh shit, I've just done that last bit wrong. It's three months free and 83% off. I'm signing up for this. <laughs> There's no obligation to sign a lengthy contract and they will not charge you during the free trial period. So what have you got to lose? Give Surfshark a go. Let's do a shot, a shot prayer. Yeah, 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 sure, please, yeah. sure. Father, we thank you and bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for all bringing us safely for this gathering, oh Lord, for this podcast, oh Lord, take over in the name of Jesus. And the destruction, destructed Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. No mistake, no error in the name of Jesus. Through this podcast, oh Lord, let life be saved. In the Amen. name of Jesus, let the nation redirect their thinkings and um, all their law so that things will begin to go in a godly manner in the name of Jesus. Amen. Save Amen. life in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, Amen. bless Sean in the name of Jesus and bless everyone here in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless. Thank you. So here we are with Isabella and John Wedger. If you've not seen the story, absolutely mind-blowing. Starts out with Isabella getting, I can say it's the first five minutes of YouTube. I've got to be careful what I say. <laughs> Let's just say she was trafficked into a situation and ended up in one continent and then over here. And it involves very diabolical practices and arts. 
but throughout this journey there is good things a blessing of pastor patrick and we're going to be talking about his church towards the end what he's done for isabella there's going to be links in the description box if you want to subscribe to john's channel if you want to contact isabella and pastor patrick or support the work they're doing all those links will be in the description box below this video it is a very graphic story so i'm just going to give people a bit of a warning they say sometimes give us a warning if it's going to go that way and it is it is going to go that way on this one i'm just trying to control my language right now because of the first five minute rule on youtube so huge thank you for coming on guys all right always a great pleasure john thank you sean thank you yeah first then john do you want to just say how you came across isabella and her story yeah yeah i'll i'll, I'll start off and i think it, I, I mean my story's been out there and thrashed around enough times um all it is is really for me just an update and how things evolve um what happened really in in sort of recent months is that i stepped back you know from a from podcasting in general um a lot of it was the fact that the, the Facebook is just a vile platform and full of people um, that are damaged. There's a lot of vexatious people and, you know, I can't cure society's ills, but it was good for me. It it got me um, the platform I needed and my thing was getting a message out there, getting a message out. Now, throughout the, um, the journey I went on, I started speaking out about whistleblowers. Then it went to giving a platform to survivors of abuse. And then it morphed into this satanic ritual abuse. And each one come with their own sort of pitfalls and with their own trolls, as it were. Um, and then I started doing work with Wilfred Wong, you know. Uh, Wilfred, I'll give you a brief update. Wilfred is remanded in custody awaiting trial on a charge of kidnap. Um, as far as I'm aware, co-defendants, there are co-defendants that have gone guilty. Wilfred is going not guilty. Um, his welfare, he's okay. And that's really the last I've sort of heard of Wilfred. He's a very private man anyway. But um, so the update is he's safe. He's well. He's still um, incarcerated in HMP Berwyn in North Wales. Um, and if anyone wants to write to him, it's Wilfred Wong, uh, care of HMP Berwyn. And letters always go down a very, very long way anyway. Um, Does he have a trial date? I think the 8th of August. So, you know, we're, we're praying all goes well for Wilfred. His um, bail attempts keep failing. I don't know why, you know, but there is um, a vulnerable person involved in this. And again, we can't go into it because there are have been people that have mentioned it and there are certain trolls that, that, that go through every word of the content of what I say to try and find it an illegality so they can then pass it on to prosecute. Um, Absolutely. So Wil Wilfred's thing was satanic ritual abuse. Um, I did quite a lot of work with Wilfred and it was really getting out there uh, about SRA and the reality of it. But the one thing that um, we overlooked is, uh, and uh, Isabella will go into a lot more detail and then we got the expert Pastor Patrick here as well, was that satanic uh, abuse and, and, and satanic worship goes on not just with the white and upper class is of the of the country in these stately manor homes, which is what we've really been concentrating on, like in a De Dennis Wheatley novel or something. It's been goes on in all sorts of cultures, and um, more recently, been looking at the prevalence of of demon demonology, demon worship, and and its connection to organised crime as well in um, within the black communities, within the Asian communities. Um, I dealt with it first when I was in the police. I dealt, dealt with a thing called Opia, OPEA, which is a, a version of voodoo. And voodoo had come over from with the West African slaves to the Caribbean, you know, the mainland, you know, the Guiana and, and then onto the islands. Um, and then we got a thing called Santeria. And really it was a way in which um, the, this indigenous paganistic belief system which was like idolatry and the worship of, 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 of um, numerous gods polytheistic sort of worship uh, they weren't allowed to practice it so what they would do is they would morph it into Christianity because also at the same time you was having the um, 
what was he, the the Inquisition. So anyone that was sort of displaying anything really that, like, to do with indigenous beliefs were, were, were killed. Unless it was Christianity, they were killed. So in order to survive, they they, they morphed it into um, this religion that, that became Santeria and became um, Opia. And, you know, we see it a lot in, in the UK culture. You used to be, be able to get the, the, the loot magazine, which was like a trading magazine. And in the back, you could... Um, call on certain experts if you wanted court cases to fail you know if you wanted your enemies dealt with and i never really took much interest in it i know the police took absolutely no interest in it but now uh with the work i'm doing you know w with the church the pillar of fire and with a certain outreach worker is is really exposing the prevalence of of this demonic worship and what is really strange is it's the same gods that are worshipped so, you, you know, there, there is like these nine realms of demons and they're worshipped all throughout the world. They're just given different names. And the way they're invoked is, is it's the same, but it is different as well. And, and the criminal world has relied on this as well um, in order to have a case dropped, have police evidence go missing and things like that. So I, when I sort of stepped back, I basically had a couple of days off and... I got a phone call, um, and as you know, I've been on here with with Chris Lambriano, you know, former gangster, a notorious gangster who's given his life to God and doing, does a lot of good work, you know, helping people, a uh, good Christian man. And Chris has got this sort of extended um, family of friends, you know, and a lot of these people have come from crime and, and want redemption and, and have started really going to church and wanting to put right. And uh, one one ex-criminal, he, he gets in touch with me and he said, uh, John, he said, there's a guy I want you to meet. This guy I think can help you because he knows about this. And he said, no one's talking about it, especially within the black communities, the West African communities and the Jamaican communities. And it's running everything. It's running the prostitution. It's running the fraud, you know, the 419 scams. It's, it's behind it. And this is how these cases keep collapsing. And it was really strange because he said to me, how many cases have you been on where they just collapse? It's calamitous. And I went, yeah, it happens all the time. And he said, it might not be down to corruption. It might be down to something else. And this is ancient. And again, when we look at satanic abuse, we're going back to, to times beyond Christianity, to Babylonian times. So he introduced me to uh, uh, probably the most enigmatic man I've ever met. And this guy has dedicated his life to outreach work and to expose in the prevalence of it. And in doing so, he said, John, I know you work with, with the, um, the vice, the child prostitution, however we term it, the sexual exploitation. I know a woman that's been through this um, and she was put into it very early on. She was given up to these demonic realms and brought over here for the purpose of, of sex trafficking. I want you to meet her because her story is very powerful. And this is when I got introduced to Isabella and I listened to Isabella's story, which is very complex, but it's like ticking boxes, box after box after box. And then we've got on the table, we've got a list of exhibits. Now, I won't go into these so much, um, but before I pass over to Isabella, I, I want to really go on about, I don't even like touching these things, right? Um, and there's a reason for it. And, and it's this box here, right? sigils of the craft again again some of this stuff will have links with within realms of masonry but it, it, it goes above and beyond it and um one of the guys that, that I, I did um an interview with and then he came on your show was a guy called darren jeffries darren is a lovely lovely guy and if you're out there darren i wish you all the best because he truly is one of the bravest men i've ever met and a quick synopsis of Darren's life. Darren was um, really, his family were conned into putting him into the care system. Um, and he was abused by teachers. He was abused by judges. He was put in care homes. He'd come one of the most prolific armed robbers this country's ever had. He got a 35-year prison sentence. Um, and, you know, this guy's come out of prison and never gone back in there. But the reason he went into crime was because of what he endured as a child. And this is something which keeps consistently coming up with the victims and survivors, not just of abuse, but also ritualistic abuse, is an element 
within um, uh, this abuse realm, and, and it's called the chase, and it's where children are taken to a wooded area at night. Usually, these dates are highly significant. They are stripped. Um, they are then um, told that they've got to run. But accompanying these children will be um, a small cadre of always, they say, well-spoken white men, right? Very well-to-do. And I've heard some names in high society, which, again, I'm not even going near that, but um, these people know what they've done. And... and the thing is, these kids are made to run in the middle of the night, naked, frightened, freezing cold. They're all caught when they're caught. They are dragged into a central area, like an altar area, where they are whipped with sticks, and then they are sodomized. Um, and this is called the chase, and I've heard it time and time again. Girls are involved in it. And someone said to me, this is the worship of Moloch. And Moloch is an ancient deity. There are other names for Moloch. Moloch is named in the Bible. We was in church the other week and, and there was a, a, a service mentioned about Moloch. And Moloch is linked to Baal and all these demonic, demonic realms. But, but Moloch is sometimes um, symbolized as an owl. And the reason it is, and this is a former um, victim of satanic abuse told me this and said, you're going to find Moloch worship because an owl will always torment its prey, right? Before it captures it and kills it, it will give its its prey a sense of freedom, um, and that all adds to the adrenaline rush. And we hear now a lot about the adrenochrome, and it's very strange because when this um, outreach worker um, sat me down, he said, "You talk about these things, and they go on within voodoo." within Juju, within Santeria, and with Opia, right? They, they are practiced all around, you know, the, the Western, Sub-Saharan Africa, and in the Caribbean. And he said, it's Baal worship, but you can't call it Moloch. And of course, Isabella will refine you know, my knowledge on it. But I want to just show this before I pass over. And he goes and he gets um, one of these pendants, I don't even like touching these things. And it's strange because when the pendant was first given to me, Isabella had the cord that went round this pendant. And she said, just hold this cord in your hand. I held it in my hand and you was there. And I threw it down. It was like holding stinging nettles coated in acid. It burnt my hand, but it was just cord. But it was the energy around this thing. Now, bear in mind, Darren Jeffries was taken to a wooded area called Rainbow Woods. Uh, just outside of Bath in Somerset, and this ritual was done on him many times. And this this guy, this comes um, from someone who's a demonologist and sort of an expert on the voodoo, and he produces this sigil now, uh, this pendant. Now I don't know if you can hold up. It's like um, the god of like the woods. It's like a bearded man uh, with these antlers, and there's a third eye thing going on there. I showed up to the camera. Uh, honestly. Do you want to take a photo of that at the end, James? Yeah, so can yeah. put it on big. Yeah. And he said, This is what they will be wearing around their necks when they are chasing the children. And it sort of brought it home to me, you know, how prevalent this is and how uniform this is across the globe. So, what happened then was um, an offer was made to, you know, do you want to come on board with us and help um, people? In, in, in what you say, your testimonies, um, people will listen to them. And of course, I've just finished giving evidence at the government inquiry. I've just finished giving evidence at a civil case against the Metropolitan Police, you know, and, and my story's been corroborated, you know, and, and I've had a result on both occasions. And so um, I'm working on board with Isabella, a victim of, of, of prostitution, trafficking. And also then I was introduced to Pastor Patrick, um, uh, who runs a church in East London? So I went along there, and it was like I've I've gone, Sean, to church after church after church, try, trying to find some sort of spiritual home. Right, I've been in all the the, the Catholic church. I, I even I went and saw the cardinal. He wouldn't see me, so he deputised it down to the bishop. And and when I was sat down with the bishop for London in, in uh, Westminster Cathedral, he basically was blaming the victims of Ted Heath for destroying a good man's name. 
and I was brought up a Catholic, and so I did a podcast denouncing any connection to the Catholic Church. I was sat in churches, I've never felt at home, and I go along to a predominantly West African church. At the time I went there, I was the only white person there, but I was at home, and I felt the power of the prayer, the protection, you know, and what was said to me, you can't be a, a part-time Christian against a full-time devil. And if you, th if you think that they are not spending all their time praying against you, you're mistaken. Um, so I understand that this is, you know, it, it's on two levels. We've got the criminal element, but we've got a spiritual element. And this is alive and well, you know, in there. So again, I met up with Isabella and then we started then doing podcasts and putting the word out and the response has been incredible. So that's enough from me. I've, you know, everyone's so, I'll hand over to Isabella now. You stay there for a little bit longer. Of though. course, yeah, yeah, yeah of course yeah. I will, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, Isabella, thank you very much for joining us then. Thank you for having me. So where does your story start? It begins all the way from West Africa, Nigeria. Um, I was born in Nigeria and my mother actually left me at the age of two years old to come to England. And at the time I was going through a situation where I was actually starved. So I was being moved from different homes and I was going through a starvation. So I was one of those kids that had big heads and, you know, bony bodies and um, I moved from home to home. I didn't have no parent around. My father was sort of um, a womanizer, but he wasn't so interested in myself. So what had actually happened was initially when I was actually born in Nigeria, uh, my parents and my ancestors were into a thing called mammy water. That's sort of, it's it's actually refers to the westernized, which is marmaids, is like a marmaid. So they dedicated me to a water spirit, the goddess of the spirit. And they made a deal that I was supposed to be their um, sacrifice, basically. I was supposed to bring the money. In the, Af in the, night, in the um, black community, especially in the West African, they so money oriented. So it's like they just want money. So if they come from a poor background, what they tend to do is they tend to go into um, a ritual or they tend to go go to different sorts of demons to make deals in order to bring money to them. So um, at the age of 13 years old, I was I went to Abuja. That's the northern side, which is the Islamic side of Nigeria. And um, I ended up meeting up this particular girl who was very beautiful girl and she said to me um you're very beautiful do you know do you i want you to come and meet my auntie at a time and i said okay so i went to this building right two days after and i met this two lady right and they said to me don't worry you know just sit down so they i was sitting by a table and they gave me food to eat and then all of a sudden they just sort of calmed me down they said don't worry you look nervous but nothing is going to happen to you so um this black man came in right bald head european features so he walked in and um there was a mattress on the floor and they said to me um i should go and lay down so i said why they said to me look if you want if i want to that do I want men chasing me? Do I want money? Do I want to get rich? Do I want to be famous? And things like that. That, you know, people, men will love me. At a time, for my age, I was a very vulnerable um, young person who didn't have their parents around. So I, I ended up, right, I went on the mattress and they said to me, okay, we want you to sleep with this guy. So I was quite nervous. But what the guy, what the guy was like, don't worry about it. I think he was in, in his late 40s, I believe. And he said to me, don't worry about it. It's all going to be fine. I've never had sex before. So um, they had this white sheet on, um, on the mattress on the floor. And then I laid down. They took off my, um, they took my, un they told me to take off my underwear. So I took off my underwear and I'm laying there very scared. And he's saying, don't worry, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. 
and I broke my virginity that he had sex with me. So imagine a 40 something year old man having sex with a 13 year old. And then they took my underwear and they took out afterwards this lady. I realized I was bleeding because I didn't know much about sex. I, I could see blood on the sheets on, on my underwear. So I was scared. They go, don't worry. And they took my underwear. They took the sheets and I never heard of them ever again. And then two days later, prior to that, my mother was trying to get me to come to England. I, I, it was actually for so long, I wasn't able to join my, my mother. As soon as I did the ritual, the sexual ritual, right? Where I have to stress is an, a virgin blood, right? Is very powerful because when you take a virgin blood, that's like a DNA, Right. And then when you take it and you go and give it to the water spirit, what you're actually doing is my DNA is actually linked with the demon. So wherever I go in the world, they know who I am. So if I come across with an occultic man or anything like that, they know me because they know me in that demonic realm. So two days later, I get a call, right, that I'll be joining, that my mother should come and pick me up. So my mom comes down three days later to Abuja. She said to me, I'll go ahead of you, right? You will come later. Within, I think it was five days later or six days later, I ended up in England when I came to England. But she had warned me and said to me, look, I'm married, you know, to this man who was from a different tribe from her. And she said to me, I've got your little siblings, right? And she said, and I'm also pregnant. And I, and I thought, okay. So, but when I came in, into the house, expecting to join my mother and expecting to, you know, meet my family, instead I was being treated like a house help. So um, at a time, right, my, uh, my stepfather, when I looked at my stepfather, something about him, I didn't like him. He just felt like he was a pervert. And I just didn't like him. And she said to me, you know, he's the one who paid for your ticket. So you better get used to it. He's your father. You need to start calling him dad. So at a time, um, he ended up, right? He, um, we, there was an incident that happened and he actually hit me, my, you know, my backside. And I was only 13. And this is a strange man who I've never met in my life. and. I found that quite offensive. So what I'd done was I spoke to my mother about it, my, but my mother sort of didn't say nothing. And I was crying and I said to him, do not hit me. And he, he goes, I'll hit you again. And then he hit me once again. And this time around, right, I knew about 999 because my mother had told me if there was any emergency or anything, call 999. So I called, I called the police immediately. And when the police came down, the police was um, sort of took a statement and said, what do what do I want to do? So I said, right, I would like him to be locked up because I didn't find that funny. I do not know this man. I've just come in and um, they arrested him. They took they actually took him to the police cell for the night and he stayed over. When he came back to the house. He looked me clean in the eyes and he said to me, you know what, you are going to pay for this. And he said it was such intent, such evil intent. So the next thing I know, my mother actually put me in a particular school, in a girls' school, Brentford, uh, Brentford School for Girls in um, Hounslow, somewhere, it's somewhere in the West um, London. And I remember I said to her, look, mom, I don't want to go to all girls' school because I prefer mixed school. And she kept on saying, what, do you want to have sex? with? Do you want to go to a mixed school because you do want to have sex? And so she forced me into that school. But she had an agenda because when I went to the school, there was a particular girl who was in that school and she was a bully, but she was also working as a madame. So she ended up introducing, she came in as if she was my friend initially. She, she could tell that I was broken. Obviously, uh, an African girl doesn't know much about England and being bullied in school. So she came in as if she was trying to help me. But instead of helping me, she was actually grooming me, right, 
into going into the sex industry. And then there was this particular man who was living in the estate while I was there. My mother and my stepfather at the time had introduced me to this Jamaican guy. And um, one time, because obviously I wasn't being treated fairly, I wasn't being treated fairly, you know, at home. So I sort of ran away because I'd got the police involved and the police did not bring the local authorities. They didn't bring the social services in because from what I do know now, but then I wasn't aware that if a minor reports something like that, you know, that um, a man has hit a woman, a, a young girl in her bum what usually happens is they will get a social worker in in order to, you know, investigate to see what's really going on here. That wasn't done. So once again, your local authorities failed me. And um, this other Jamaican guy at the time had, um, he kept on saying to me, do come and see me. For me at that particular time, right? It did not occur to me that why would he say to me, come and I should come and see him. Because initially in Nigeria, we have this thing where if, a, if an adult is talking to a young person, you have to be very respective, respectful to them. So for example, my mother and my stepfather has introduced me to this guy as a friend, as this neighbor, as a friend who was living on the third floor in Ivy Bridge. So at a time, when I was I was crying one day and he said to me, no, no, come, come upstairs. So I went upstairs to him and the next thing I know, he gave me uh, marijuana to smoke. I've never smoked marijuana. And he um, he goes, that would calm you down. And when I took a, uh, a puff and it sort of calmed me down, then he went into the kitchen he had, um, I believe now knowing he had actually drugged me, but then I wasn't aware. So he had actually, um, he put this whiskey, I think it was either brandy or whiskey in a glass and he had been drugging me all this while. But that first day initial, when I actually met him, I drank, I just took a little bit and I felt sleepy. Like I felt like I was going in a trancey kind of state and I was sweating and he, and all of a sudden I could hear voices, but it's, I could, I, I wasn't seeing clearly, but I knew people was there. And all of a sudden I'm sweating and I feel someone actually taking off my clothes and everything. And I'm sitting there and I couldn't even hardly move. The next thing he had done was he took me into his bedroom and I, he started having anal sex with me. And one thing is I can tell you, but now I do know, but in those times I wasn't actually aware because you're a child. You don't really, my, my, um, my knowledge wasn't so mature at that stage. So I remember him taking me into the bedroom and I remember him, um, ejaculating, you know, having sex with me in my anal for the first time. This is not something that is a tradition in, in the West, you know, in the African culture. So um, I was screaming, I was, I was in pain, but he said to me, you know, you're a big woman now, it's okay, this is what we do over here, you know, you're a woman, come on, and he started speaking into my ears, you know, like, try, he, he was actually grooming me into getting into the sex industry, a lot of anal sex, and I remember after he'd actually ejaculated inside of me I believe I do actually know for a fact he was a, he's a demigod I don't know if you actually know what a demigod is but uh, a demigod is actually when you go back to the um, Nephilims you know when the angels was being cast down from heaven they mated right they some of them that are still human half human and half um, supernatural being so it's like they have um, there is actually a um there's power in their sperm. So when they ejaculate, when he was ejaculating inside of me, it was actually alive. So a lot of times, I mean, it was spinning. My um, base chakra was actually spinning uncontrollably. So I was wanting sex more often. And then I remember in the process of uh, of meeting this other girl in, sc in school, 
she got she changed the way I looked you know she sort of doled me up and she invited me to parties that I wasn't aware of initially she would take me to the park she would get me to have sex with um, certain Somalian boys you know because this girl is actually comes from um, a big crime family in in West London they deal with drugs they deal with drugs importation from Jamaica they also deal with um um frauds and all kinds of prostitution and things they they're well known they're even affiliated with the social services so it, it's it's a big it, it's actually there's a lot of um link to everything where I'm going with my story so um I later on found out that my stepfather right was actually paying right this other guy in this Jamaican guy in the block to have sex with me because I'd actually seen him exchanging money to him several times and as I grew much older I did ask him I said why are you and he lied and he said that he was actually dealing with his car because he was a mechanic but at no time did I see his car you know in his you know in his garage so um, later on, as I grew older, I realized, you know, what was going on. My mother was actually aware that this Jamaican guy was actually uh, was um, a pedophile because, in fact, she had spoken to me over the phone when I finally came clean to her about my story that she had um, that there was a lady who reported the incident that he was having sex with an underage girl and the police dropped the charges. So, and it went up from there where this other girl was sending me to parties. She'd be like, come to parties, I'll go to parties, I'll be drugged, right? And I'll be having sex with, I, I, I could have sex to up to 40 men. At, at this particular time, I'd been having, you know, getting into prostitution now. But they were getting paid for me actually having the sex. I wasn't getting no funds. I wasn't getting no money out of it. In fact, there was an incident where this particular girl actually had um, pissed on a bottle. I begged her for a drink. She pissed on a bottle and made me drink the piss, mm. made me actually drink it. So and um, it got to an extent where she was really bullying me to things and there was fear for my life where I could not go to the police because if you go to the police, a lot of these, especially not having a mother who's there for me and also not having nobody to protect me as a, you know, as a young person, it's quite scary. And a lot of the times I remember even it got to an extent where I ended up having a, a, a actual sexual ritual with him where I was actually in this Jamaican guy's house and there was like six men all dressed in black thing. And I remember there was sperm all over me because that was the first day I actually um, came out of my body. So I asked to travel, came out of my body and I was looking down and I could actually see my vulnerable self down there. And I remember at some point I was like, God, I was actually screaming God, like I was screaming Jesus, like God, you know, in my, while I was up there and I remember literally it was it was the most terrifying thing ever to go through. And it's crazy because after I'd had sex with the Jamaican guy, I kept on going back. I didn't stop. It's just like I kept on going back. It's like I wanted more of him. And I'd be even as I grew much older, I kept on going to the house and I always wanted to sleep with him and it was always anal sex. And along the way, right, this, even when I went into group sex with the other girl, they all knew each other. My mother knew this Jamaican man. My stepfather knew this Jamaican man. And the girl who was at Brentford school knew everyone. So everyone knew each other. It was already being planned. And it got to an extent where um, I was sleeping around with loads of um drug dealers, um, rapists, pedophiles, which, you know, sleeping, basically I could have sex with any man as much, it, it didn't matter. So I could have, I could finish having sex with 20 men and I want more sex. I just keep wanting more and more and more. And the reason why that was, was initially when they took my blood in Nigeria and also with the, with the demigod that was being done, 
Don't forget as well, even when I was a child, I was being sacrificed. And as well, my mother had been doing works, right? So every time I was having sex with men, I was basically making them all money because all the D, all, they were actually secretly video recording me and selling it worldwide. So it got to an extent where I'd be walking down the road and a man would just stop me. But because of what was actually inside of me, because I believe, I know that I did have incubus. I don't know if people know what incubus is. You have incubus, which is for, it's like a sex demon. And then you have succubus, which is the man. So I had incubus. So a lot of times um, they hire people that can use incubus, sorry, incubus or succubus to make money. But with myself, they had actually put it in there because that was why when I left Nigeria, right, and then I had sex with the first guy, that's why the actual, um, the um, my base chakra was spinning a lot. So the more sperm, basically what was inside of me, and also I believe I had multiple demons as well. I also had Mami Water spirit, which is the mermaid spirit, which comes from the water, right? And the more I was having sex, the more sperm I wanted is like every time I did that on a spiritual level, I was actually um, putting like a spiritual, um, let's put it wealth in the spiritual demonic realm. So my case went to the extent where I was, um, I remember even the time where the, 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 um, I went to other parties. There was another party I went to, which was somewhere in Surrey, right? And I remember I slept with these rich guys and once again, I had another sex ritual. My case went to the extent whereby I could not sleep. A lot of the times I'd be at home. And I knew there was an entity there, but I couldn't stop it. It was like to put fear in me. And a lot of times I remember sleeping loads of times on the bed and I've got my bra on, but I wake up, my bra is off. And even I'm sweating. I know someone has actually had sex with me spiritually, but, you know, I wasn't even at that particular time. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know where it was coming from. And there was an inst. I remember even going back initially when I first came in, my stepfather used to walk around naked. He used to wear the shortest, showing off his penis. So he actually did that on purpose. And it got to an extent where I was experiencing very terrible demonic um, activities, you know, in the home. It got to an extent where I was very, I was always fearful. I, I became very anxious and then I started smoking weed from the introduction of weed from the Jamaican guy. I used weed to cope with a lot of the emotions and even when I was being drugged a lot of the times I sort of liked it because at a time as I got older because it was a way of coping. So um, it got to an extent where I was um, my life really went down the drain um, I could not keep a man, like I could not be in a serious relationship because when once they do mammy water, which is the mermaid spirit, the water spirit, which I'll explain in, in a minute, what actually happens is the, the mammy water, right, it becomes like a spirit husband. So there's something now attached to the person spiritually where any man that comes in to try to be in a relationship with me spiritually or chase them away. So immediately the man has sex with me, right? He doesn't want to stay with me. And it got to an egg, um, the water spirit, just to get people to understand what mammy water means. A lot of people might know this from West Africa, you know, Ghanaians or Nigerian, but mammy water, right, is a mermaid. And in the water, I, I know, I believe that loads of people have actually heard that there is another world on the ground in the water, or sorry, inside of the sea. There's actually another, it's like a whole new world down there. And what actually happens is there's different in the Bible. It talks about Leviathan. Leviathan is the, is the head of the, of, of, it is sort of like their God of the sea. But then you have the goddess, which is the mammy water. So that was what, 
you know, they, they, the sacrifice they'd done. And that was the oath that my mother had taken to do with myself because everything that happens in the world in terms of the materialistic things, you know, the makeup and things, they actually go through the mammy water because that's why they portray in the Western world as, you know, mermaid, which is Ariel. You always see she's always looking beautiful. She's always sitting there with, and then she's got very, um, very expensive things around her. And that's where the mammy water. So a lot of in the Western world, sorry, in the West African um there is a lot of, um, they love to worship ma mammy water, which in different tribes, that's where I'm going to show the candle very soon, which in, in the African tribe, in the Yoruba tribe, is called Oshun, or you can call that Oshiri, right? Where you, there's a wish in, in the Western, they do a thing where you go to the well, you throw coins in because you're actually dedicating, you're actually dedicating that to that water spirit. You're saying, this is what I want and you throw it in and you get what you want. There's different levels to that. You have the ones where they can chant, then you have the ones where they go deeper, where the person can actually wear, San, in Santeria, uh, it, it's just to define what John um, Wedger had spoken about Santeria. Santeri, right, originated from Nigeria. It actually, um, it was, in his right, it was to do with during the time going back to the slavery times where, you know, they were using that. But it's actually a worship of the saints. So they actually worship the saints and they wear white garment. And if you notice in the Santeria, they have different belts. They will have the yellow belt, they'll have the red belt, they have different. So it depends on what sort of, um, what sort of um, goddess you're worshipping because there's different levels to it. Um, so it, it, in my case, it went so bad. Um, my kids, I couldn't have my kids, but there are things that I cannot talk, uh, talk about because obviously for legal reasons, but there were a lot of what happened to me affected my life in general. I could not get a job. I was sort of blacklisted at a time. Um, I could not get a job. It got to the extent where I could not think. Um, there was, if I went each time I went to even go to school. I could not think I could hear voices. I mean, literally hearing voices talking to me. Let me put it this way. As soon as I stepped my foot into this country, I started hearing the voices quite quick. And I'm not talking voices in my head, like literally me and you talking. I could hear things. I'll be hearing voices telling me, go here. It'll be telling me to go from point A to point B. For example, if I wanted weed, it will tell me where to go. And I'll walk straight there and I'll, I'll get the weed. Anything it was to do with sex, right, and contributed, you know, sperm into the demonic world, I was able to access. But when it came down to me getting a job, right, being in a settled relationship, that was impossible. That was not in the, it was not in the contract for them. So just to stress again, my blood was the very thing right, that linked me to this. And it was easier for the occultic men to actually be able to see, to, to know me. So for example, I could be walking down the road, the occultic men, whether black, white, whatever it was, they could literally, they, they knew my energy. And it got to an extent where my eyes started changing. I was literally changed. Um, I remember one time, right, when I met the outreach worker, he had, he saw he he looked at me and he goes now hold on your eyes is green and I thought huh I actually looked like a snake at a time my eyes were very pronounced you could not even look at my eyes because a lot of the times when I spoke to guys what was inside of me without me even opening my mouth I could get a man a man would just want to have sex with me pastors right would sit in front of me masturbating so it was like what was inside of me could literally get them to do whatever I wanted them to do without even having to say it. and that's how powerful it was and it got to the extent where I myself I just wanted sex all the time I just wanted and it got to an my life was basically down the drain I remember sitting down and I knew something was 
behind me and I got scared. It got to the extent where I used to sleep with the covers on, you know, covering my face because I didn't want to see what was around, what was in, in the house. My stepfather was even using my pictures and he would use some magical stuff like voodoo stuff. he will be rubbing on my eye and he'll be even rubbing where my um, my uh, vagina is, you'll be rubbing it. So this is the sort of things that people can do when you're dealing with voodoo, African voodoo. There's different aspect to it. And um, when once I had sex with a man, I was spiritually linked with the man. So on a spiritual level, they could think of me, right? And I could feel their vibration from wherever I, if I was thinking of them, they could pick up on the vibration and pick up the phone and call me. So it was that, that was really where my life went. Wow, what a powerful opening statement from Isabella. You're an absolutely brilliant speaker. The detail is just absolutely mind blowing. And it's, I just find it fascinating, all the cultural differences as well. well, well but also the similarities. Um, there, there was one lady I spoke to and she wrote a book about her time in, in um, Satanism and she said once that she'd taken part in a blood ritual was drinking a baby's blood, the same thing would happen. She she didn't need to be told where to go for the next ritual. The voices would tell her and everything would be laid on for her. So we see it, And again, we, we've seen people going on about priests. There's the, the Blair brothers going about the priest masturbating in front of them and things like that. So, so the pastor is just an African version of a priest. So the similarities, they all dovetail. And the Leviathan is worshipped in, in Satanism as well, which is what Isabella was on about. And then, you know, we've also seen with um, uh, th this lady that was involved in Satanism, how she would procure children for sex parties, which is exactly what Isabella ended up in. But it's just, it's that cultural difference. And we're ignoring it in society because there is this huge percentage of these young girls that have been brought over here for domestic servitude, you know, that are coming from, from the African continent, and they have no voice, and it's going on. And this is very, very prevalent in this culture, you know? So are you saying then, from your experience um, as a cop and afterwards helping people, that these girls who come from overseas then are particularly vulnerable to being trafficked versus the local girls? Well, well, what, what they statistically found is that someone who's been sexually abused has, has got a 60% more chance of being sex trafficked. You know, um, and especially if what we're getting is Isabella was classed as an unaccompanied minor. You know, where are they going? No one knows where they go. Who's looking out for them? No one is. Who, who's prying into it? No one is. And because of the cultural differences, they perhaps don't even know to turn to? Yeah, and sometimes people step away. You know, they think, oh, no, that, that, that's a black issue, not our issue, you know. Um, and so it, it'll be going on, and there'll, there'll be churches that will have an involvement in it. Same as we have over here, you know. So what kind of but jobs are these um, girls doing? What you said, service, they come over as... Domestic service, yeah, well, well you, you get them a lot as, as what you were saying earlier, as home helps, you know. Like be, au pairs and things like au that. Pairs, right, yeah. and, they, and then there's also, because if you look on Netflix as well, they even talking about um, African girls, especially Nigerian girls who are being trafficked from Nigeria, they would do like a juju, go to see a thing called Babalawa, which is a voodoo priest, right? And then they would um, give them their hair or their private parts and then they'll keep it there. They know where their parents are. And then what happens is when they, they bring them, they lie to them, right? So for example, maybe their mother or their brother would say, okay, they poor and then they want money. They'll be like, we're taking you to Spain or we're taking you to England to go and work. And then they'll think that they come in here to work. But guess what? There's a madame waiting for them. They'll take their passports away and then they'll, you know, they have to go into the sex a trade. And then the madame will say, this is how much you need to pay me right before we can allow you to go. And imagine they're not even making that much money. So all their lives, right, they're basically being held hostage and then they can't go nowhere until they have sex with so many men at times, even, you know, their private parts is, is ripped. It's really, is very, very brutal. But my 
my case was that my mother knew what she was doing. She actually brought me here lying that she was bringing me here for me to join her. But initially she had it all set that she wanted me to go into the sex industry because that's where I was going to bring money for her. So, yeah, that was my case. It's so similar, but it's just she just sort of camouflaged it as I as I was coming to join her which I thought that was what I was coming to do. Like most girls, they're thinking they're coming in to work, but it's not work, obviously. It's a, it's a, a sex um, um, thing. Um, and where does she turn to, you know? And, and um, we, we were talking earlier, and you're saying about when they, they're putting you in prostitution, there were occasions when there was police officers. Right. That, that had been clients. Right, because there was police officers. There was um, the one I went to in Surrey. There was a police officer. There was even another police officer who I had sex with. And I remember there was two of them. He was actually, he was being racist towards me as he was having sex with me. He was actually calling me a monkey, beating me, slapping me up. And, and you know, I'm, I'm drunk and he's getting me to drink. Imagine two men in my house, in my little room that I had. And, you know, I had sex with him. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the times when you when when I went to these guys, when when I I went there, at times I wouldn't even know that I was going there for sex, but I knew what was inside of me always told me. So I knew that the sex would be taking place. But at times I'm thinking I'm having sex with two men or one man, and then it goes to 40. It could go up to 40. There was an incident that happened in Harrow, in South Harrow, where I, men were where literally made me drink their piss, you know, their piss again. And then there was another instant where the man made me actually put the sperm in a bottle and made me drink it. And there were video record. They knew that I was actually vulnerable. I was much older at the stage, but they knew I was vulnerable. And it's just, it's a, it's a brutal world, really, a cruel world. And I'm just here to really let people, because, you know, within, in the African community, a lot of times it, there's this thing about shame. You're going to bring shame to the family, you know, be quiet. And I just want women, even if there's boys out there, I want them to come out and really expose this thing because, you know, if you don't talk about these things, really, how are you going to heal from it? I had to go through what I had to go through, but I had to come to a place where I wanted the change and I wanted the help. So when I came, it took me, for so many years, it actually took me many years to actually realize that, hold on, being groomed and being, you know, a pedophile, having sex with you in the anal, it made me... So... Oh, man. Mm. Oh, no. Do you want to okay. add, add yeah, yeah. anything, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And, and what we're saying is, who, who could she turn to? Her mother was involved. Her stepfather is involved. The authorities are involved. The social services aren't intervening. I mean, and there's there's an issue that's going through the courts at the moment where they clearly have have let her down, you know. And when you saw my narrative when I was there trying to do my best, how I was being curtailed at high high office. So so you know, for an English kid, at least there's that understanding, and there might be a safety net. But from someone that's been trafficked in from from the African continent, where's she going to go? She don't understand the system. She doesn't know anyone. And all she ever knows is people that are abusing her. But also what we've got to look at is this spiritual element because she's now been placed under this sort of spiritual curse. So wherever she runs, you know, we can hide from people physically, but then she's sitting there thinking spiritually that they're tracking me on that level as well. So if, if law enforcement are participating in these acts of having sex with girls who are underage, I'm, I'm just euphemizing. I could say this far more crudely, but I'm not going to because of the YouTube uh, community guidelines. Um, if cops are participating in this, then does that mean it's not going to be investigated, If even if only a few of the cops are, in, in, are participating well, yeah. in it? Can I just say something? In 2019, after I went through my first deliverance with Pastor the Battery, I called the pill I actually had the courage now to speak up because Pillar of Fire, the church, was trying to help me and an outreach worker who sat me down intensively and said, Look, this is not your fault. You can't be dealing with guilt and shame when you was being groomed, you know. And I actually 
literally for me when I went to had the courage to go to the police in 2000, 2019 could you believe that the police right actually turned around and said to me because it's historical abuse and we don't have no evidence to do with any DNA or nothing we can't deal with it but yet this girl who's put people you know this girl and this other Jamaican man Yet they're still doing this to people and getting away with it because I know for a fact because the police are actually covering them because a lot of this crime thing they all work hand in hand the fraudulent activities that the 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 criminals and also pedophiles are paying right the police to protect them so that they don't go down and. Well, 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 we saw this in the government inquiry that's just come out how the, 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 the failings with the social services of police and there's been deliberate cover-ups and, and we've seen how politicians have been involved. And what we're seeing is victims being attacked and victims are being demonised. But the one thing I, I have to say is that the same with the, the satanic stuff as, as with, with the, the juju and the voodoo is it's all to do with money, money and power. And it's all into rent. The prostitution mm -hmm. is tied into the fraudulent activity, to, to, to the criminality. And this is a religion that brings them all together. So, but if we can explain some of these, because these are things yeah. that, that people can buy and, and they're, they're totally understated, aren't they? You know? Right. Um, just just before, before we go ahead, when I reported in 2019 to the police about what was going on with me, during the investigation, right, this was what was being given to me for protection. I actually had to hold on to this in case because they were actually, my life was actually in danger at a, at a time. Pastor Patrick, which will come on later and even speak about it, that he actually said to the outreach worker, please don't let her go out on on her own i was actually on lockdown since 2018 when i met the outreach worker till literally in 2000 and i believe it was too far ending of 2019 that's when i started coming out of the house because my life was in danger i was getting notes being dropped to my door i was getting some one time somebody came and put a lucifer um on my door you know my, the entrance of my door and my neighbors could see this then they ended up, they put something, they drew um, um, an anal, someone bending the anal down and, you know, and um, sperm going through, you know, it, it was disgusting. Then I had gloves that was being put in form of blood, a, for, a form of threatening me, you know, and had fish in it as to say, basically, you know, my, um, my vagina smells of fish. It, I'd been through torment. I'd been, pe there was even an instant where, Few, um, there was somebody else who I knew that was in the house with me and you know they threatened them they told them to back off my case literally because they were trying to help me and it's been hectic it's been so since I've come out you know it's been hectic I've had to close down my social I was on Facebook and I had to close down my um, my Facebook when I came out Right, in 2018. I haven't been on social media. It's just recently because I've got, obviously, the church. I'm now, I've since I've, I've been delivered, I've been started, um, I've been become one of the people that is doing the outreach work as well. So I've, I've had to, you know, come out and help people and sort of help people through what I've been through and other, and other victims as well. So it's been hectic. It's been terrible. When once you do come out, right a lot of the times there's a target on the person's back it's uh you know my case was so bad because i was actually bringing the money the worst thing is in the whole contract i was never supposed to make money out of it i was supposed to live like a tramp and i was supposed to just have sex and just keep you know just and they will be filming me even without my own knowledge and literally selling it selling it off I've got videos of me in India, in America, even here in England and other places all over the world. And they've even filmed me when I was a little child, when I was even underage. So it's... it's, it's was there moments during the trafficking when you thought you were going to get killed? Yes. What happened? Literally when I came out, 
I remember getting a threat. All of a sudden, people were ringing my phone, people that I have not heard from. I even changed my number. I don't even know how they had my number. They were calling me up and basically just degrading me and, and calling me and uh, telling me I'm a hoe. There was instances where I was being um, the person of one of the outreach worker who was working with me. They actually threatened him and said to and said to him, back off her. You know, they didn't they didn't because the, the thing was they wanted me by myself because if I'd been by myself, what would have happened? I would have been walking down the road and someone would have kidnapped me in a car and that would have been it. And then they would have had to force me to have sex and recorded that. So in other, because obviously I, I went to the police. So they wanted me back on the game. They actually, they don't want me to leave because I'm a money for them. I make money for them, not for myself. So. Did you meet other girls in your situation? Uh, to be, I did. I did. And one of the girls actually died. There was the Somalian girl who was through the same Madame girl. She died. What was her story? <laughs> Her story, I remember she was going to parties with me, but she became an alcoholic. She was drinking a lot, the Somalian girl. And she used to go, and when we went together, she was having sex with guys as well. And then in the process, she died. I don't know how she, but I know she, she's dead now. Were there any rays of hope when you were being trafficked? Did you plan escape or did anyone try to help you and come and say, look, I'll, I'll get you out of this? Nobody, nobody at all. And even when I, my mother knew where, where it really hurt is that my mother knew. She knew because in fact, I started having attitude. She calls it, she says that I was a bad child. But if you don't sit down and find out, she knew because she sensed it. She could have come, you know, she could have come in and spoken to me and asked me what's really going on. But she actually was aware of what was going on. I remember, for instance, she would sit down and, and be like, you know, you're not the worstest child in the world. Go to school. And I'm trying to tell her, mom, look, I can't concentrate in school. I can't even take nothing in. Do you know, instead, right, she turned against it it was terrible. I didn't have nobody, no, even my siblings. She tried to keep me away from my siblings. How many siblings do you have? I have three. A uh, female or male? I have two um, sisters and one brother. And did anything like this happen to your sisters? I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked. I, I really wouldn't be shocked. Was your mother profiting from what was happening the whole time? Yes, yeah, she definitely was. She was. She definitely was. And how did um, you pull out of it then? I pulled out of it because I met the outreach worker in 2018. I, it all happened when I wanted to go to America. Because how old I, were you then? I was 30, I'm now 35. Uh, in 2018, I would have been 32 or 33, I believe. And how did you meet the outreach worker? I actually met the outreach worker when I was actually going. I was, at the time, I used to live in um, Housden, which is northwest London. And he sort of spoke to me about God. And um, he knew when he looked at my eyes because he himself had been um, in a cult. He was he actually was in a very high ranking, you know, demonic cult. A, de a demon um, is it dem demonology? Yeah, yeah. Demon <laughs> de demonology. De de yeah, that's correct. Sorry. And so he was actually aware of that. So he could see my eyes. He could see me on a spiritual level. And he realized that, hold on, something is not right about her. And he goes, um, I have Pastor Patrick. I work under the pillar of fire. And um, he sort of, um, for some reason, when he was near me, I felt for the first time, I actually felt like I was safe. Right. And I felt at peace. I just I, it, it, I was just smiling for the actual first time. And I remember I um, I went to because I've got I've always had a kind heart. I, he was waiting at the bus. But I went to pay oyster, you know, to put uh, money in his oyster. And he said, you need to you need to come to Pillar of Fire. You need, you need to speak to Pastor Patrick. 
And um, I remember because my experiences with the pastors hasn't been so great. I've been to so many different churches. And I remember one evening, Pastor Patrick called me. There was actually one of the outreach worker and a friend of mine who was in the house, a girl. And um, Pastor Patrick started praying for me and I was wiggling on the floor like a snake. And after that, I was like, wow, this man's powerful. But that's because I wanted the help. I didn't like the way my life was going. So um, I kept on reaching out to Pastor Patrick. Look, I do want to go ahead with the deliverance. I do want to go ahead. Not exorcism, but deliverance. And he asked me to come to the church. I went to the church and um, he prayed for me. And um, the first time he prayed for me, I think it took about, was it 40 minutes? Maybe 40 or 40 minutes. My eyes went looking normal for the first time. Even the outreach worker said, wow, and could see the difference. I looked before, I could look at my eyes in, you know, in the mirror and I'll look like an old hag, you know, like, and then the next minute I'll look at myself, I'll look normal. So when I looked at myself, I thought, wow. And then crazy because after I came out, one of the guys who actually wanted to put me into, into um, prostitution to go all the way to Dubai. I came out of the station and he wanted to come and approach me. This is how it works. After the first deliverance, they know that the people, the demons, the people who are working for the, the occultic men actually know. Because when once I'm being delivered, they feel the distance on a spiritual realm. They feel the, that there's a disconnection from me. So he came to the bus stop that I was trying to come forward. Well, because the outreach worker was there. They backed off. They actually backed off. And I remember I had to go through four deliverance. I went through three deliverance initially to actually clear the way. And my face, I felt better. Um, I remember the outreach worker with Pastor Patrick had to talk, work with me to build my self-confidence because at the time I really, really had low self-esteem. My low self-esteem was so low. And I remember... Um, I felt like I I didn't I I actually felt like I didn't want love or I don't have nobody. So a lot of I was at a time when I was going through my um my um uh, possession. I actually felt like I wanted to die. There were times where I even went three times. I've tried to commit suicide, and um, one time um, I remember I I was ready to go on the bridge and someone stopped me the other time i went to run in um into a car on the road and a woman just came and just pulled me back then another time i took the pills and the police ran into the house too so yeah there's been i've so when i three times i've had my deliverance the fourth time was to cut the soul tie because when once you go through the deliverance, there's a soul tie. And what I also have to stress as well, because this is things that Christians don't realize. They say, give your life to Jesus Christ. It's not just about giving, which Pastor Patrick could talk on that in a minute. It's not just about you giving one, giving their life to Jesus Christ. But what a lot of the times when people are going through problems on a physical level there's also ancestry curses that comes with it because even the bible talks about it right if you don't go through the deliverance to break any ancestry curse then a lot of the times you still accomplish that's how people can stay in the churches be praying but nothing moves in their life because they still a curse or a heck that is still on them and they don't realize and that's what happened with me even as I'm talking right now, my mother is still contacting a voodoo stuff to do work on me in other for me to go back. What happens to girls who are trafficked to Dubai and do you think you dodged a dangerous situation there? Yes, I would have been, my head would have been, they would have gotten me pregnant, right? Because a lot of um, celebrities, they go there and things. I don't want to name those, but there's a lot of celebrities that do go to Dubai and um, what would have happened? They would have um, had sex. Different men would have had anal sex with me. And then what a guy, somebody would have impregnated me, right? Then the afterbirth 
right? They would have had to eat the afterbirth to take the power, the thing that was inside of me so that it, it sort of is like a corrupt. So it gives them the power to be able to do, you know, become world leader. The guy I actually slept with in Nigeria, I believe now is a politician in Abuja who I gave, who took my, my blood, my virgin blood. Do some of these girls who go to Dubai not come back? No, they definitely will not come back. They will not come back. They'll be listed as missing. And those people have, they have things in place where government wouldn't even touch, wouldn't even go there. And that's something that I don't, even I don't even want to go into You've got that. knowledge of that, John. Yeah, yeah that, I do. That, I don't well, want to go into well, it. Well, there, there's a, a video that's just come out and it's by um, a well-known producer in uh, Poland called Pitbull. It's called Eyes of the Devil. Oh, yeah, I've got that yeah. on my list to watch. Yeah, and, and what this guy does, I've been in contact with him. He he, he follows a young girl about um, who's now the trend now is not to have an abortion, is to have the full term, but there's a market for that child. And there's three paths that the kid goes down, and, and she's discussing this openly, and it's yeah. all criminally motivated. Mm -hmm. It's all money motivated. One is a child goes out, like Isabella said, to, to the Far East countries where the child will be used for sex and or organs. So there's, yeah. a, there's a massive market in the organs. The main one's the eyes, funny enough. Um, uh, the, the, the child needs to be kept alive. So they'll be used for sex. Organs. Some will then be used um, for the sex industry and they'll be kept alive until the age of about 14 when they'll go for organs. Again, um, the other is that, the, sorry, four paths, that kids are just sold straight away for organs. Uh, but the other one is that they're sold into occultic yeah. realms. So they are sold into, to, you know, these devil worships or, or whatever, the human sacrifice. They charge them more because they don't get the organs off the kid, you know, because that they'll then mutilate them and they'll eat body parts and, and whatnot, yes. as we've heard time and time again. They actually, yeah. they do eat it because when they eat it, especially if the, if, 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 Let's say if the person is possessed, has a special power that they want, they take it off. For example, if the afterbirth, you know, the child, because it's still innocence, so they take that because a lot of the times demons are so dirty that they actually want is is the they want something pure. Mm. They don't they can't go for something corrupt. They have to go for something that is pure to actually give them that power, you know, to be able to do what they need to do here on earth and and and, and the stuff we got here shows remotely how someone can have influence because so, want to go through the stuff you, yeah sure yeah. So we got a mix of candles okay. and oils right this one here it's court case is the court case we actually know someone who's actually burned this right and has actually got off a court case this the way this actually works is it works in different parts you could actually um, use an incense for example or you can write the person's name or the judge's name underneath a parchment paper and then you put the candle on top and then you light it up and if you smell it they're, they're very they fragrant smell very lovely. Incredibly fragrant yeah so you, you could and you can buy these in in crystal shops yes anywhere I mean, that, that's an interesting one, Isabella, yeah. isn't it? Hold. This is the water spirit, right? This is the ocean. This is what they use in Santeria, and they also use it in the Yoruba tribe. This is what, for example, if they wanted something like money, they will burn this, and then the goddess or the gods will actually give them what it's they want. Bland, so huh? that's, that's one there. And you have this one, which is... People might know this one in the occult. It's actually um, power of love. It's actually to do with King Paimon. Not Paimon, he likes to be called. This is one of the nine, um, the nine kings, the nine demonic kings is King Paimon. And it, if you look at the back, it's got the Psalms, the Bible. So they'll camouflage this and tell you, oh, this is for love. But what King Paimon actually does, right, he can cause people's relationship to break up and it causes people's relation for example it can give you money and fame and power what you need but it will always cause infidelity in a marriage and, and, and there's a film called hereditary that's out on netflix and it's all it's dedicated to king pyman 
And it's a very disturbing film. It's a horror film. It's one of the top 10 horror films. And it's all about the worship of Paimon. So. And then there's also a legwa. This was one of the candles that was being used for me. As you can see here, is actually got the red and the black underneath. The black means absolutely death. So when they were using this for me, they actually burned this for me. I was supposed to be like a beggar, basically dead, nothing a waste, and then everything just goes wrong. So everything just goes wrong. Again, it smells, you know, it's got a fragrant. Everything smell. just goes wrong. And then all of a sudden, it just, um, in the end, is death. If you, someone burns this for anyone, complete chaos. Everything, you lose your job, everything will just go bad. So we have a um, reversible candle. This, for example, if someone's put a heck or anything, you can use that to reverse whatever heck and things, you know. But these things right, are so dangerous because one of the things that they do not tell people when they're dealing with these is that a demon will always tell you, right, do this, do that. But in the end, there's always, there's always a, a, a lash in the end, there's always something that is going to happen. So, for example, if they tell you, I want you to do, I want you to, um, I want you to bring salt, for example, let's just say there's always a point where you keep feeding it, feeding it. By the time, you know, he's going to want something valuable, maybe your child, sacrifice your child. But he'll always ask you for something that is dearest to you that you would not be able to sacrifice. And it does that because it knows that if you don't, is the blood once again. He knows that he can kill you or kill someone in your family or your mother. And then in the process, you know what? It comes to death. But what demons always want is blood. All these are all shams. The sex is one part of it. But the main key thing that a demon always wants is blood because the blood gives them a leeway of them having access into the soup into the physical realm that's what because they don't have the power that god has so they need to use blood to make their powers more greater so that they can come in human flesh in order to activate that's why a lot of times they prefer right people in leadership because then it can control the masses and, and if, if we think that this is yeah, if we see this one again look made in mexico um and we think that this is just myth or, or nonsense you look at what's going on in mexico at the moment and and when you uh, you've the got the crystals um, can you see the crystals yeah. inside of it yeah. yeah and and you've got towns uh, the, the border towns you know where you can go into these shops and they, they worship um jesus malverde and all these the the um the, the gods of crime and we, we are seeing more and it's more like big in, blue one. They, they're yeah, more in into Lu can I just stress they're more into Luciferian they're actually more into Luciferian and a lot of people who go into Luciferian will actually know that Lucifer himself which I've always known even when I was a child that Lucifer himself is actually a blue is a blonde hair is a, is a blonde hair it comes like a little child with blonde hair and blue eyes that's actually when they go into the higher realm. You actually get to see Lucifer. That's where the outreach worker who, you know, is working with Pillar of Fire, he actually knows because he went into that higher realm. The and then look, me. you have all like breakups. So if you want it to break up someone's marriage or relationship, it's so easy and you it smell smells that. so nice. Yeah, smell That's it. the voodoo oil, which is attraction oil. So you rub that on yourself and then any man, if a, if a woman... If a woman wants a rich man to attract a rich man, you can do that with the oil. Not saying you're seeing this in Mexico a lot. Yeah. So many of the cartel and the cartel members, and it's influencing the young kids. They're moving away from Christianity, yeah. and they're moving to these very, very negative belief systems. And you're seeing it all the time out there. So it's um, and 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 this is where when you when you've got communities that are coming over from the third world, very strong belief system in there. And it is alive and well. And this is one of the things we want to stress. You know, it is. The more people are moving away from Christianity, from God in this country, this is filling the gap. And it's and it's fueling crime. 
Right. Even the Moloch one, right? When you this is actually Bell, right? I'll explain Bell. Bell. Bell in the Bible was when the Israelites, when Moses left the Israelites, he told Aaron to build um a calf. You know the calf? And they were worshipping it. Said, take off all your juries, and that was where but he likes to be called in the world, he likes to be called Bilal. Bilal is actually one who deals with the law. So, and then you have other demons like Azazel, which deals with, he was the one who taught humans how to build weapons, you know, mass weapons of and, destruction. And if you watch uh, the film Fallen with Denzel Washington, that's that, right. That is about Azazel. Azazel. And it's it's right. very strange how there are films out there that are actually showing it, you know? Right. And then you have Bethlehem, which Bethlehem, obviously, this is affiliated to Freemason. Obviously, they 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 worship Bethlehem, you know, the have. So these are the sort of things people would wear these things and think, oh, that looks cool. But a lot of the times it can cause possession. It's like a leave is is kind of like a gateway to want to get possessed is a gateway to it it's it's really dangerous and what i'm saying is because i i'll need to step down now and, and bring in uh, my good friend pastor patrick there is help out there and help needs to sometimes come just not in support and in friendship and protection but also needs the spiritual help yeah a spiritual cleansing and then spiritual protection and there are people out there yeah it's taken me a long time to find somewhere um but I'm blessed to have been introduced via ex criminals um, to, to such a, a, a good guy. So, if I may take my leave, I've just got sure. one more question then. Yeah. yeah. African voodoo, where did it come from and how did it start? It in actually what country? It originated in West Africa. Most of it originated, if you go, it goes back to slavery times, like, you know, John explained, because they they all worship different types of entities. So they worship um, God of the sea, God of thunder. There was different types of gods. So what had happened was when they were uh, shipped, you know, a lot of, and they were introduced into Christianity, they held on to their practices. So a lot of those practices, that's why the westernized, it goes into Santeria. But a lot of it originates back into um it was a form of going into trance. It, it, it's, it's been demonic. It's always been demonic, but it goes in. Yeah, and and countries like Benin, it's still Benin. a prominent religion. Uh, but it, we've also got to look at right. um, paganism. It's no different. The worship of certain, it's idolatry, the worship of, of, of um, polytheistic, all different gods. So, so we see it, you know, in the Outer Hebrides, the Vikings, the Nordics, it's all the same. And what you'll find is this uniformity in belief. So like uh, Isabella said, there will be worship of the, of the water spirits, of the thunder spirits, the, the fire spirits. The forest, the whole the, lot. And it, they will all have their own um, um, dominions that they control, such as finance, such as power, such as politics. And Benin, in Benin, what they actually believe in, they have different, is the Santeria practice. But however... What they actually deal with is a serpent spirit. It's like a white um, serpent. It, it's it's like a, a goddess that has um, it has like a snake going through it. In certain parts of Benin and certain parts of Africa, they allow the snake out. They have a temple full of the snake, but they allow it out um, certain months where you can hold on to. It. It's called ban uh, dam dambala. Is actually called Dambala. That's what they actually worship in um, Benin. And they will actually allow the snake out and then people hold on to it. People can talk to it and sort of ask it what it wants. In Benin, they love the water spirit, but they also love the serpentine spirit, which Pastor Patrick will go into. And and, and in, in more recent times, we look at Haiti, it, you know, right. it, it's where, where really the abolition, abolition of slavery came. Yeah. where they took on the might of the French military mm -hmm. and they did it by selling their souls. And then if you've got people like Papa Doc, who was the head the head of the Haitian government, who started off as a doctor helping people, going around the country and curing a lot of tropical illnesses, but he went over to voodoo and the story didn't end well. It turned into total chaos and corruption. Yeah. And, and of course, they're paying the price now. It's got the worst child abuse records, corruption through the roof, human rights violation. It's a country that sold its soul. So you can see it live and well. 
and then you know? children going missing and then yeah. you, you know and a lot of the times these in those african um um voodoos there's a lot of um sacrificing the kids the children are a key point if you want to because what it comes down to is poverty because they keep wanting money it's all about wealth and a lot of the times when they want to go higher in ranking you know to live that wealthy they always have to sacrifice children children is a key word is either you give it right you sacrifice it to the gods or the goddesses and then when it gets higher they will want to sacrifice the, to actually kill the kids, which comes down to the blood. And, and, and this, this, this is where blood is the key is the key thing and it, in everything. Well, this is where two worlds collide because when I was on the river police, we dealt with a body of a kid. This so was, my next question Adam, is the Tulsa Adam. How prevalent is African yeah. voodoo in the UK, yeah. and does this tie into the torso yeah, of the boy the found yeah. in the River Thames? And of course, oh, yeah. what, what, what I've now been told decapitation and water yeah uh, and there you have it all you know that's it, it. It's there in a nutshell you know and that is that, that was a ritual it. and that was so was ritual. that african voodoo or was that yeah. a branch that 100%. is that is that is definitely powerful african definitely voodoo. it would do it, yeah. it would be there is no way around because where there's water and then the blood would have been there the body would have been there it's definitely it's all ties in yeah all definitely did they ever trace a culprit for that I think they were barking up the wrong tree. They were going to one country when they may well have gone to another one, but they never got anywhere with it, never got anywhere, you know, and that was high up, you know. So how prevalent is it in London? <laughs> well, well, I'm just beginning to find out how massively prevalent it is, but these guys, Pastor Patrick and the Outreach Worker, they've been on about this for a long, long time, and they've been frontline in this, and they, they've done it with hardly any support. And... Um, and I've just been brought into this world, you know, with Isabella, and it, it's it's shocking. So, how can people support Pastor Patrick? Do, have you? Is anything going to be set up for him? Yeah, uh, Pastor Patrick will explain that there, there is a, a charity running, and um, is there a way for us to donate and things like that? Y yes, there Pastor is. Patrick. Yeah, yeah, yeah there Pastor is. Patrick. Yeah, so Pillar uh, hopefully, fire. Pillar of Fire Ministries, Pillar of Fire, and uh, I, I'm really taken back. The can most I, proactive person I've ever met in my life. Can I just, one of the reasons why I stuck with Pastor Patrick, because I'm very, I'm one of those, you can call me a conspiracy theorist. I don't trust people. I have, you know, with the lifestyle that I've sort of lived, I have every reason not to trust people. And one thing is I can tell you when it comes to Pastor Patrick, since I've been coming through this, I literally had bills. Pastor Patrick has taken money out of his own pocket. As paid to clear up my debts when I didn't have no money to eat. He paid, he's actually helps me. Not much pastors in church because in the Nigerian culture, a lot of the times we're brought up in churches anyway, but a lot of it is all about, you know, money making. But I can tell you with pillar of fire, they give out and they don't receive. And it's so amazing. That's what has really kept me there because I'm like such a good heart. That's a that's a church that people need to be going. You you know, it's like I want to make sure that people know that whatever you're going through, right? I don't know about Christ Embassy. I don't know about KICC. I don't know about any other church. But what I can tell you is, pillar of fire is the real deal, right? Whatever problems you go through is like a we're like a family. We don't. I let Pastor Patrick come. This in. is in Dagenham. Yeah, in Dagenham, Dagenham and yeah. Plumstead, but Plumstead. he has, yeah. yeah. So, well, if I may step down yes. and make way for uh, Mr. Well, but thank you once again. Thank Sean, you, John. Yeah. Thank, thank you, John. Yeah. So, Isabella, you said that it was an outreach worker that influenced your life and the transition began, and the outreach worker introduced you to Pastor Patrick. That's correct. So, could you describe what happened? When I finally met Pastor Patrick, he was um, he was such a powerful man because he had prayed with me over the phone. Um, I started, I remember from what I can recall, right, I remember being on the floor. I remember him praying about ancestry curse, serpentine spirit, mammy water spirit. I remember him praying about any blood or any sort of um, occultic link 
and I remember I remember being on the floor. I can't rem- I remember spitting and I remember loads of oil being placed from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. And I remember getting up and really and I could I felt lighter. Like there was a weight on a spiritual level. Me, it felt like I'd been holding onto baggages spiritually. Something had been weighing me down. And I felt like I was floating, like I was more airy. That's how um, my first delivery, that's how I got to meet Pastor Patrick. But I met Pastor Patrick through the outreach worker. And um, he introduced me to Pastor Patrick. At the time, I was very reluctant. I was like, no, I don't like pastors. I don't, because at the time I was, um, I was into looking into other faiths all manners of faiths and Jewish and the whole lot. And um, I was even beginning to talk, you know, wanted to convert into Judaism. And I remember when I met, I I didn't like the name Jesus, to be frank with you. And um, when Pastor Patrick started praying and saying, Jesus, Lord, I was manifesting. So whatever was inside of me had to come out. It had to show itself. So that's how... You know, I met Pastor Patrick. Thank you very much for coming on, Pastor Patrick. Thank you very much for having me. When you met Isabella, what was your first impression? Did you immediately know what had to be done, or did it take time to learn that? Well, uh, in the first place, um, Isabel said, uh, Pastor Patrick is powerful. Pastor Patrick is nobody. Jesus is powerful. Amen. And... uh, when I met Isabel, uh, true, uh, I had working uh, outreach worker. He called me up and told me that he wants me to speak with somebody. He I said, okay, as usual, because as I tell him, go speak with people, pray for them. But this particular person in the person of Isabel refused to talk to me. They don't want to do anything with any pastor. No, no, no. She's got enough pastor that, in fact, she even offered to, uh, when he finally want to talk with me over the phone, he said she can only help me. Only she have the gift of healing. She can only help me in praying for people for healing. But for me to do anything with her, know that she's okay. She don't want to do anything with pastors. Yeah, she have um, experiences with pastors that they don't want to come. Uh, it, it's not pleasant that she don't want to come anything to pastor. It's okay, no problem, but I don't, uh, 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 I'm not disputing you, but can I pray for you for two minutes? He said, he said and reluctantly, you know, that she can only pray for me and, and help me. He learned I'm a good person, I have a church, he can come and start praying for people. Somebody that is possessed with many demons, over nine to ten demons in her, saying he want to pray for somebody. What do you think that will happen? Not, you know, transfer not. what is inside her to the person. Now, when she was talking, this people was telling me who, the, who, the kind of thing, some of the things inside her. So, as the question they asked me, did I know why talking to me? The spirit was telling me certain things from the person talking to me. I said, okay, if you allow me to pray for two minutes, so that I got to cut the long story short, because I didn't want to hear anything. I said, okay. I started praying. I didn't know it was in her house. I started praying two, three minutes. And uh, the uh, walker starts shouting, Pastor Patty, stop, stop, stop. Pastor Patty, stop, stop. I said, what? That is manifesting, scattering everything in the house. Please stop, stop. Okay. I said, okay, try to help her. I said, she's done already. Try to, try to hold her. Please put her legs so that she know how to say. That's how I stopped the prayer. Then she got the message. Oh. The following day now, I goes, okay, let me speak with Pastor Patrick now. I think that I feel somehow. That's where we started. And um, from there, I started praying with her, talking with her through the uh, uh, outreach worker because I don't have a number until uh, the outreach worker started talking to her, counseling her, telling her that, listen, all experience is not the same. You've known truly, you've passed through many churches and many pastors, but let's give this a trial. Then, I think what convinced her was um, the experience of the outreach worker because the outreach worker, his own deliverance, another level. Demonized, occultized, marine, he was into occult, was into voodoo, was into crime, was into everything. But God delivered him and it was not easy. 
So he used his case um, through Isabel, and that was what convinced her to submit herself for deliverance. What kind of resistance and did you have to this, and what kind of tricks did you play? Um, a lot of the times when I was possessed, I, I could read people, so I knew what people was thinking, and I'm hearing the demons talking to me. So for me, there was a lot of resistance because of what I'd been through with other um, pastors and other churches where I'd gone into the churches, I'd been a part of the ministry, I'd been um, evangelizing, I've even been baptized. I, I'd done a lot of things to the point where I could literally look at people and I'm praying and I'm prophetically telling them about themselves. I'm actually what the world might know a psychic. I would be telling people about themselves. So for me, I just felt I've always known that I have a special gift because even before the possession, going back to Nigeria, I prayed for a girl. There was a girl who um, had done a blood covenant with her um, uncle and um, she was levitating from the bed, you know, at the age of um, 10 years old. Um, and I remember being in a, a, a campus like the boarding school. And I fasted for three days. The third day I prayed for her and she stopped levitating. She stopped having the nightmares. So I always knew that I was destined for something great because if I wasn't destined for something great, then why would the devil use the demons to want me so badly? Why would my mother want to give me up, you know, as a sacrifice if I wasn't special? So I think there was a resistance based on a lot of the way that the churches and the pastors have treated me like an outcast. You know, this self-religious, like, you have to pray, come in, be modest. Mm. And I always hated that. I always, I felt like Jesus Christ associated himself with a whole lot of, you know, people that were criminals, people that were possessed. So why do other churches make people like myself feel like an outcast. So there was a lot of resistance. I've had a lot of hitbacks from various churches that I've attended. How hard is it to help people like Isabel with the tricks that they play and the resistance and the demonic energy doesn't want to come out, does it? It wants to, to stay inside you. No, that's a very good question. And uh, I'll start by saying, correcting an impression, that um, people talk about, and you tell them, come for prayers, for deliverance. They say, oh, we do exorcism. They will come. Uh, do you, are you, are you, do you do exorcism? Do you know about exorcism? No, 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 no. When you talk about exorcism, talk about witchcraft. When you talk about exorcism, we talk about occultism. There are people that do exorcism. We do purely healing and deliverance. The ministry of Jesus Christ is the ministry of healing and deliverance. I will prove it with the word of God. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible said, Jesus was the one speaking in that Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Look it up. He said that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's what you're saying. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He have sent me to he healed the brokenhearted. People like her that have broken down, they need to be healed. You know, and so he have sent me to preach deliverance to the captive and the binding, you know, yeah, of the to the world that are bound, liberation of those that are bound. You see, what is it? Jesus has come to preach. You have to preach the gospel to people to hear the word of God. And the word of God will start breaking the spirit down inside them. He said he, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from the, all the oppressions. The word of God is what delivers and not man. Now, when you hear the word, now they apply the, the deliverance method by them praying the word of deliverance to you. It, there's no two ways about it. So by doing the deliverance, it was not easy, but a lot of resistance. Praying, she was trying to resist the, the, the word of God, expecting what is going to happen. But before you know it, as she said, when the Spirit of God came down upon her, as upon other persons, 
yeah, and anybody hearing to the, the I say hearing to the word of God can deliver it to anybody hearing me from anywhere and believe that he wants to be saved and come out from similar situation or other you know, situation, God can deliver you through the word. Uh, deliverance is the in thing that you give your life to Christ, as Isabel said before, is very good. Thank God you give your life to Christ. But there are certain things you have done in the past. How do you get out from there? How do you break some of this covenant? How do you come out from all this mess that devil has put somebody into? Praise God. You see, it is, it is something no human can do. It can do that through burning candle. When you're burning all these candles, you say you're using these incense, you're putting that person into perpetual bondage. She told you that her, her life was down, that she even um, attempted suicide. This is what this evil spirit can do. But I want to say something, she says about herself. When I met her, I told her, God want to use her. And the devil is threatening in her as well. So the devil knew that she had the gift of helping people go, using her to deliver, talk to people, win souls to Christ. Then the devil put this evil spirit in her. It's not possible for some one person to uh, be into uh, uh, receiving different type of men, two, three, four, five. You somebody that have one wife, you know how trouble it is. I'll be begging you to do the show. You'll be sorry. No, I'm tired. Well, how much I 10, 20, 30 people? That is a demon. It's not her again. But before going to the, met the methodology, how she feel in the deliverance, how it go, I want to warn all the people that make love to her, they're all in trouble. Oh, yes. Amen. No, 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 no. It's not. They would say they, they feel they are enjoying. Yeah. And they are all caught men. No, no way. Mm -hmm. Because of what is in her. Yeah. She was initiated from childhood when she was born into water spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's not an ordinary person. She was coming up again. They groomed her. More demon entered. Any man making love to her is putting their male organ into the mouth of a python. Satan have a blood bank. He also have a spam bank. Spam bank where he to collect virtues of men. You don't go about sleeping with people anyhow. You are wasting your life. You are wasting your destiny. Some people in our court might want to do it to get promotion. You get it. It's a temporary thing. It's going to come down because it's not given to you by God. People should understand that. There's no free uh, sex. There's no free anything anywhere. You got to pay for it. You enjoy it for five minutes, but you pay for it with your, with your destiny, with your virtue, with your life. How did you feel after the first deliverance? Did you feel that just a fraction of what was inside you had lifted? Did you feel there was more work need to be done? Yes, <clears throat> I knew that there was going to be more work that needed to be done. But at the same time, my first deliverance, I just, my eyes, you could tell from my eyes and I felt a little bit lighter, but I knew that there was something inside that needed to come out. But where I made it easier was because I was willing. I actually wanted the healing because that's why I was jumping from churches to churches because I was hoping God was going to use somebody like Pastor Patrick to obviously help to deliver me. But all of the churches I went to, they were so infatuated by religion where even if they did see, they sort of passed. I remember one time I went to a family um, a family person's church. I can't mention her name. Apparently, she's meant to be a reverend mother, right? <clears throat> and when I went to the church, she actually said, even after when I confessed to her, she, her exact words was, I knew there was something because the outreach worker spoke to her and said, how could she come to your church? And how could you know her mother, but yet you never picked up that this girl or this young lady was possessed? And I remember she said, I did know, but I couldn't help her. But hold on, you're meant to be working for Jesus Christ, running a church for Jesus Christ, because Jesus, just like how Pastor Patrick said, Jesus was dealing with healing ministry and deliverance ministry, right, through the Holy Spirit. Why wasn't she able to cast out the spirit? Because that wasn't of God. So literally for me, 
I is wanting, I have to keep stressing to everyone. You, if you're, if you've been through or you're going through, you must want help because help cannot be forced. Jesus Christ has given free will. The devil, the difference between God, Jesus Christ and the devil is God gives everyone free will. The devil forces, right? The devil puts things down your throat for you to sort of be tempted. That's the difference. So I actually want to help. I just have to stress that to the public. So how did you learn to do the techniques of the deliverance? Yes, and actually, um, when I gave my life to Christ, uh, 19, uh, 2018, sorry, 2088, and uh, from there, I, I went to deliverance school, went to the school of ministry, went to Bible school, and by then, people were telling me, uh, get ready, God is going to use you. Actually, I don't know what the gift I was having, but people saw it in me, were telling me about it. And um, through the, after passing through with the church, I was in there, I was sent on first uh, missionary out. Uh, uh, my first posting was to Cameroon. We had demons fly. Yeah, they will tell you, men or women will tell you, that they are, I'm a witch. And they tell you how many demons that is inside them. Oh, yes. If I remove my cloth, you mess for me. Oh, doing delivery, I do it five days in a week, Monday through Friday. Every, uh, it, it will fight you, the, that theory, my body, everything. But uh, let me come here. She mentioned something about her eyes, uh, Isabel. When you start, I said they have many demons, more than nine different demons in her then. Yes. So that what particular eye she's talking about, that is where the her power is. That is the serpentine eye, seductive spirit is in the eyes. If you look at you now, if in that opposite, you bring you down. Even if you don't want to have sex with her, you will make you the person down and seduce you. With her eyes, she will know what make you to surrender and then yep. go into her having sex with her. Mm -hmm. The power of the eyes, mm -hmm. I saw entire eyes. So, and when we're doing deliverance with her, it was terrible. But each of the demons that want to come out, they start manifesting and say, screaming like that. If it is serpent that want to come out, it, it you start bringing out tongue and making. Mm. Yeah, when a spirit of Dog want to come out. That is immorality. Power to sex many times. Mm -hmm. Dog can have sex anywhere. It don't. It don't care. That is the uh, some of the spirit. When that the dog spirit want to come out, it start barking. Ruh, 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 ruh. You that is delivering. If you if you are not, not strong, if not express it, you run. Some people that run run away. Oh come on! But when the serpent want to come out, that's the trouble. You start wiggling, wiggling, and scattering chair, throwing chair everywhere here and there. You see, so any demon that want to come out, there is no easy. But many uh, can right. see the can, yeah, it can just open showing the eyes. this to the yeah. camera. Yeah. This was me. Sorry, just bear with me. Bear with me. So this was me before. Yeah, her eyes was like Even a line. You can see my eyes is defined. Is like duh. yeah. That was yeah before my deliverance. From when you met the outreach worker to the first deliverance, how long did that take? Sorry? When you met the first outreach worker, I mean, when you met the outreach worker to the first deliverance, how long did that take? It took, I met the outreach worker, was it October? No, October, the 10th of October. And I remember I'd been speaking the phone conversation was a few weeks. I believe it was, was it five days? I believe Pastor Patrick, it was five days. Uh, let, let me come in here. She might not remember. I might properly. not remember because it, I was. It, 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 was, it was not easy. Why? She wanted to come out. But the things inside her refused yeah. to come out. Right. So it was a, a serious prayer. It, she will uh, accept to come this week. But we're talking about the, 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 she will change. No, she's not ready. Then I know what is going on. Then I told the uh, outreach worker, don't worry. Let's take it into prayers. Don't get angry with her. 
They don't want to release her, but God is interested in her. So we went, went into prayer and fasting for her. We didn't tell her, the outreach worker and myself. So I before you know it, she accepted to come. She didn't know what bring her to come. And uh, it was really a, a, a wonderful thing to have her to accept to come because if you force the somebody to come, not, not willingly, there will be no deliverance. They are really willing to yeah. release what you have yeah. so that the Spirit of God can use it. And can I just say something what I, I forgot to touch upon? And a lot of the times when I was possessed, even when I wanted to go through my deliverance, I could not remember. It's like they wiped my memories of a lot of things because I remember the outreach worker had asked me, have you ever done any ritual when he was young? And I kept on saying no. And he kept on saying, no, think back, anything. Do you know it had to take the first deliverance and the second deliverance Correct. before I actually remembered that, hold on, I'd actually had a sex ritual in a buja where my blood was being taken. You see how the demons work? It actually closes up your memory because it doesn't want you to talk because when you're talking, you're exposing them, is in the exposure of telling the truth. That's where the deliverance starts to take place because it's a form of confession. And that's where the deliverance, if you don't confess or you don't, nah, nah, you won't get delivered. You could pray from here till next year. She no said that uh, when they, um, they broke her virginity, uh, it was a, it's a serious ritual. The, the man and the people, they knew what they were doing. They bought, got a new white uh, bedding, basically. Spread it on the place because they know they need the blood of a of a virgin, and immediately she can recall telling after the the, the the relationship with the man, the, the girls came rolled the sheet immediately with her stain on the with bloody the, the man took it away, and that was covenant. It that was major uh, deliverance to her, for somebody to be free. They had to be, you have to break block covenant. One of the covenant that is hard to be broken in deliverance is block covenant. When blood touch blood, is terrible. But her own blood now is not to, the first man that sleep with you have formed a covenant with that man. How much I went an occult person take the blood and go into their occult kingdom for rituals. So it's, it's a terrible covenant. It was hard for God to break it. But God is more than any covenant. The blood of Jesus is greater than Amen. any other blood. The covenant of the blood of Jesus superseded every other covenant. That was what we use. God used to deliver her from that blood covenant and that blood ritual. In the weeks before you met the outreach worker, what was your life like? Smoking a lot of weed, hearing voices, the voices intensifying. I remember the whole house atmosphere. I knew that there was an entity in the room. I was becoming quite very scared to the point where I was beginning to cover my face. At times I couldn't even stay in the front room. I had to be like in a room. It wanted me to always be in a room. So I'd go, I'd go in a room and I would cover my um, blanket before I went to bed or I'll stay up all witchy hours smoking, smoking weed and at the same time watching demonic programs at the same time. And, what are demonic programs? I mean, the originals, the more darker, the better. And then on top of that, masturbating a lot and just basically nothing. Just, I mean, absolutely... I felt at a time, I felt suicidal. At one point, I actually went on my knees and I was crying to God and I prayed to God. I said, God, I don't know. I don't think I'll live to see next year. This was my prayer to God. I said, I don't think I'll live to see next year. But please, God, if let me leave this light, let me leave this earth and go to the spirit world where I can help other people that to stop people from going through what I went through. This was my, I, I was actually praying for death to the extent where I couldn't stand human beings. I was actually being very, I was shouting a lot. 
to the point if I wasn't careful, I would have had a heart attack because my chest started hurting, intensifying very a lot. And I remember calling an ambulance twice within 2008 and 2017, sorry, 2018 and 2017 before I met the outreach worker. I remember feeling like I want to blow my brains out. I was actually looking for gun. And I felt like I just wanted to die. I didn't want to live anymore. I felt like nobody, everyone just hated me. I felt hated. Everywhere I went, people hated me. Um, I didn't have friends. I couldn't keep friends. Um, I didn't have no money. I couldn't find a job. Every time I went for job interviews, I'll be rejected. I remember even beginning to beg people in the shops can you please i remember one in one christmas the christmas priority before 2018 i remember going into my local shop this was one of the guys who wanted to put me to prostitution they actually four pros, four prostitution house in the area and i remember going in and begging him for money because I needed bread and milk. <laughs> Sorry, I just... Thank God she was not there yet. What is saying that it was real bad. When the artist worker that worked with Pillar of Fire Ministry, Meta, he told me, Pastor Patrick, please, we will need to help this, this girl. So well, that she, she saw a lot of potential and she saw the places... You saw her going, people that want to destroy her. No, that is not good. That, you see the grace of God upon this lady, but the way she's going, they will destroy her. Actually, when they had deliverance started, it was another battle. This her to say she felt not loved. After the deliverance, and during the deliverance, going to tell her, no, show the love of God. The devil is telling her, no, nobody loves you. Go and kill yourself. Go and continue messing up. The more you're going through deliverance and you're sleeping around and you're watching dark things and you're masturbating and making the, 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 the demons be coming back. The Bible says when a demon is cast out of a person and he goes out into dry area and they didn't see anywhere to stay, the Bible says he will come back to the person who was delivered. I call it a house. I will come back to my house. See a demon regarding the house, the body of a human being as a house. I'll come back to my house. If, if the Bible says, if he found that place swept clean and garnished, he will go and take eight other demons, sorry, seven other demons with him, making eight to come. And the life of that person will be worse than what it was before. What does it mean to find a sweep and garnish? That is a way if that person stopped committing sin, now as delivery, the demon go. When he go back again, Committing sin, living, smoking, we taking drugs and all those things. They're going to come back with force. The person, as we're doing deliverance, the people using her for all this drug and all this sexual something, uh, perversion and, you know, using her to make money less and that, they were about to kill her. They were about to kill the art, art, uh, art, art, art worker working with us, thinking that, oh, we are not using... This girl again to show because they are using her as a as a cash cow. So all the sex she was doing, they are not giving her any They only give her uh, a spike her drink, and then she will be using another person be making money. Do you and, know? I was sorry, Pastor sure. Patrick. I even as as Pastor Patrick is talking, is like I feel like it's going back. I remember being raped, and I remember even trying to enjoy it. And I go into, it's like I trained my mind as I was being raped to actually enjoy the, where it's like I feel like I'm not victim. I'm the one in control. But I know I'm being raped. Yeah. So they, we have to show her like thing. That is, so Jesus loves you. Don't forget about what you're doing. That's why I say, and it's, it goes, he sent me to bind a broken heart. She was broken, bastard and destroyed. Yep. So it takes Jesus to bring her back. They're talking to her too. 
Jesus loves you. They're telling her, I love you. The, uh, the uh, artery worker began to tell her, look, we love you. Come on. They, because I'm telling her, nobody loves you. Go and kill yourself. Go and kill yourself. The more you take drugs, the more you take weed, or oh, come on, or oh, alcohol, it's going to be euphoria, temporal. When it finishes again, the reality will turn on you. She wants to kill herself. No way in drugs or alcohol than Jesus Christ. Give your life to Christ. You can see her now. Pretty girl, <laughs> lovely girl. For what she's been now, uh, working with the Ashley worker, helping yeah, and yeah. bringing people out. Uh, uh, those that mm. she knows them, mm -hmm. and she can talk to them. Anyone hearing her confession now, because we say in African setting, you don't come out. Oh, the daughter of so so and so, you're bringing um, shame to the family. Yeah. But somebody is dying. Do you know how many people have killed themselves because they don't have anybody to confine yep. it? You want to bring shame to the family? Please don't keep quiet. Come out and talk to somebody. We are here to help you. If not, if they have disappointed, you come to Pillar of Fire Ministry. We are Jesus Lee. We are Holy Ghost is in charge. And we'll pass you deliverance and God will deliver you. The Lord that delivered is a good God. He will deliver anybody. What changes? Did you notice in Isabel after the first deliverance? Oh, the first deliverance, you see, if we look at her, she talk about, okay, let me tell you this. There was a time the artery worker called me that they have a, they were, somebody visited them and uh, somebody the artery worker was also talking with. Before you know it, the lady was sitting near, a, a, a close to Isabel. The lady ran away, started screaming. That she has seen a, 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 a demon, a spirit. What happened? Her face changed to a dark and no object. The, the lady couldn't stand it. She ran away. Even that she walk around. So Pastor Patrick, come, 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 come and pray I for I look like Grace Jones, the dark, you know, when you go charcoal dark. That is, I went dark. One minute I would turn sort of, I will look white. Yeah, the yeah. next minute I will look orangey. Then the next so minute, I'm going five so dark. Different, seven I could, different I could change into different colors. So the first thing we noticed was her complexion came back. I have no more faith. Yeah. The artery yeah. shouted, are you? Are you the one or not? Say, so, Pastor Paul, what did you do? I said, I did nothing. So I can see a human being now. That's the first thing. And again, the next thing you can notice is telling lies. She stopped telling lies. Yes. The demon of lies is, yes. is number one. You can't get, they won't tell you the truth so that you can't cast them out. But the first thing you notice, her face change, her eyes come back to normal, her normal complexion come. Now, she start remembering her past and start telling us how she, the grooming she passed through, the initiation she passed through. But her major problem started from, but she was initiated to water spirit. Go have a hold. Water spirit is dangerous spirit. And Leviathan deals with spirit of lies because Leviathan lives in, is a sea monster that lives in the sea, but it deals with lies. It cannot help itself. It actually, its mouth is full of lies. And that's what I was, I used to tell a lot of lies, but I, not big lies. When I was talking to people, I used to lie about my life. I used to lie a lot. I used to lie. And I wasn't even a good liar. That's the worst thing. So after the first deliverance then, did you start to stop taking drugs and stuff? Yes. Actually, before the deliverance, I stopped taking drugs. Before which the was first. Which was hard. As soon as I met, the, I met the outreach worker, I was smoking drugs at home, and he saw me, and I actually transformed. And he goes, if you do not, he goes, do you want my help? I said, yes. He goes, if you do not stop taking the drugs, I will leave immediately and I will not help you. And I wanted the help. So I quit. But believe me, it was hard. It was I actually, I remember quitting. It was actually in October, I believe either the 15th or the 16th of October, 2018. That's when I actually, and I have not touched any drugs since then. But it was hard. So it was hard. Is there a demon of drugs or do drugs allow the demon in easier? Both. It is too. They, they work hand in hand. That the demon of alcohol, the demon of drug, is a deadly demon. It, it, it brings this confusion. 
You don't know what they're doing. You only want more, 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 more. That's the demon of the drug. That was what makes some of it's just like a religion. Some of these drug dealers, these drug cartel, they can kill anybody to have this drug. And when it, you, you, you are in need of this drug, they start panting. They can do anything. They can sell anything. That's why they say their car, they say their thing, they go and rob to get this drug. It's a demon that pushed them to go to do that. Right. Just to touch upon the drugs based on my experience. What when I was taking the drugs, right? I used to trip into another dimension, the demonic world. So they had clear access to me in the demonic realm. And then on top of that, I could I was hearing them clearer than even before. So for example, I used to know certain events that was going to happen in the world before it happened. I had access to the actual REM. So you know how some people can astro travel, some people can be in another spread. I didn't need, all I just needed was the drugs. That's why I needed the drugs to escape from the reality that was going on in the world. But I was also going into the demonic REM, which they could clearly see me and access me easier to control me into the physical. So other than weed, did you do any hard drugs during the trafficking? They, um, I remember actually, yes, someone made me smoke crack. I've actually taken crack. I've actually taken cocaine. Um, when I had a few of my ses uh, sessions, I remember they drugged me with a specific drug that will not make me remember because the times I would be having sex with the guys and in the morning, I can clearly see that I've had sex, but I can't remember anything. So there was a drugs to kind of wipe my memory off. The person that started that trend was the Jamaican guy in the blocks of flat that I was living in when I was 13 years old. So did the traffickers use drugs to control the women and get them addicted? Right, because the drugs can actually help. First of all, for example, if a predator or a pedophile wants to have sex with a young person, by giving them that drugs, it would not be able to, even though they know that something is wrong, but they won't be able to remember how they're going to go to the police and say this person, because the police will ask, what did exactly did the person do to you? You wouldn't remember. So that's what a lot of the uh, sessions I went to, those were the sort of drugs that was given to me. There was also drugs as well that was given to me to make me want more and more and more because I remember in South Hara, I had sex with over 20 men. Right, and it, I wanted more and more. I even had instant where certain occultic men would rob something that the voodoo man has given them to rob on my um inside of my vagina. In fact, the one the Jamaican guy in the blocks of flat did that the first time. He robbed it in my anal, and he robbed it on his penis. He was doing that for a while until my hole sort of went a bit bigger where he could and he'll be whispering words to me like um words like that you uh, you you like this in jamaica and will be saying tell me you love me to the point that i was subconsciously out of my body that all i could hear was his voice so to the point that when i got home i'll be masturbating and thinking of the anal sex that i've had with him what would you say to these occultic men that did these things? It's an evil man. And if you trace that person now, the life of that occultic man has gone down. If he's alive, he'll be wretched. Unless he comes for deliverance. Because he was doing those things, he was occult. He thought what the, the demon he was serving in occult, the one that gave her things he's using, go and sleep with him. A, a young child, eh, and then you gain power. He didn't know. The person he called a, a young child was also demonized. And then devil left, using her as avenue to steal the virtue, the gift, the destiny of man. So that person is a wasted person now. Wherever that person is, you should look for pillar of fire and come for deliverance. And people like them, everybody that have slept with her or slept with other people, that is not your wife of messed up, uh, rape people, or uh, use, uh, sleep with, you know, young children. It's evil. It's demonic. You need deliverance. And 
If you are not delivered, if you are not prayed for and God deliver you, your life will be in danger. You will be a wasted person. That person will not achieve anything in life. Have, uh, do you know, I even had mm. married men who actually had sex with me, which I didn't know they'll take off their ring. And in fact, when they found out through the phone, the women used to, they were even doing their own witchcraft of me. Jamaicans would go and do their obia, you know, on me. I even had verbally people, w women were looking to kill me. I literally, women were even hiring guys to want to kill me when their men were the ones who came to me, but they married. That's not my problem at a time. So it was that bad. So you said the outreach worker had an occultic background. How hard was it helping him with his deliverance? Yes, because of the experience of the outreach worker is the occultic and demonic background. He knew what he took time. His own deliverance took over two weeks because we into he was in the high occultism. Was practicing. He was being consulted as a, as he as he somebody reading what do you call it tarot. Tarot card or something like tarot that. Cards. So the only deliverance he got. So his own deliverance was high and terrible. So God, did, nobody gave it time. And uh, to tell you something, this particular person, the government that tried to rehabilitate this person, it couldn't work. But a uh, but when it was going to even into probation, and I know about it, but but it's then that along the line. They found this person change. He doesn't miss his appointment. Behaving, he come to probation. He's not giving probation. People around the police book, our car is given. Says, this person is joking. In fact, police people followed him with um, a, a, a gang style of trying to win to Christ, a bad boy. They followed him all over. They organized crime somewhere, which we know about. And uh, where they're selling drugs, they arrested this young man. Because they are monitoring this guy. And uh, the release order to this guy interviewing is okay, come on. What is so and so a tree worker? What is he doing, telling you to do? Are you telling him to do runs for him? Kill, kill people, sell drugs? He said, no. He's just telling me about Christ, that I should stop crime. I should give my life to Christ. They slap him, they beat him, torture him. He said, no. Do you know this person? He's a demonic person. He's a, he's a serial killer. He's a drug dealer. He said, but this is what they refuse. They put it, pull out a drawer and showed him pictures of him and this guy, all the places they are going, shops everywhere. We know you tell her what he's telling, thinking that the outreach worker was using the young, know, because they know that guy is a bad guy, he's a, he's a gangster, using him to do runs or real drugs. But when they found out it was not true, that was when they know that the hand of God is upon this outreach worker. Then along the line, they ask, What happened to you? They say, Pastor, I start praying for. Uh, you know, uh, probation officers. So that's annoying. That is how they start living, giving him freedom. So, oh, this is a changed person. Now, nah, hear this. When there is, around the place they are living, then there is a gang crime, sorry, these gang people uh, are attacking, fighting, and doing everything. The police will come and meet him. So, what do we do? So, let me call Pastor Patrick if you give me the go. So, you call me. So, the, so, there is a crime, so, so, and so, a two gang uh, fighting that the police want me to help. Do I go? I said, go. I pray with him. Go. So police know now that he's no more bad. He's not using it to uh, talk to people, outreach them, bring them out of crime. They have helped a lot. So that was what happened because of his experience of God. That's why he, Isabel was able to come out. It was not easy. Yeah. He tried everything yeah. to pull him back. But because he had the experience, he was helping him. They'll be going to the road, people will be dragging to fight him. The outreach worker was attacked not more than, not, not thrice, not or many times, physical many times assault. On a physical and spiritual, yeah. because I was there, right. Physical and spiritual, there's always a hit back. What, that should leave the, her so that they can take her back. How, how this actually works is when once you try to come out of it, right, they're going to want to attack the person who's trying to come out of it and the person who's trying to help. Yeah. Right. Because even Pastor Patrick went through a car crash. After you helped me for my last deliverance, not the, to cut the sew tie, he had a car crash. But I let him actually speak about that. 
you, you, you're going to experience a lot of attack. But yeah, but because he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world, that is in the demon troubling them, he will always protect me. He will always protect my family. He will always protect everyone working with me. So don't fear from, uh, to come out. That is what people are saying. When we come out, what are we going to do? Because some people are badly oriented. The orientation of giving, coming out of crime, coming out of prostitution, coming out of um, demonization is wrong. Oh, confess Christ. Uh, Christ, I love you. Thank you. No. Uh, you give my life to Christ. Accept it. No. That's not true. You have to pass through deliverance. That's Jesus right. come to deliver people. You have That's to pass right. through deliverance That's to right. cast out some of these demons, break so ties, and then reintroduce you to Christ. Give your life to Christ properly. And then the process, you start reading the word of God to heal the That's broken right. hearted. Start confessing. Start coming more for prayers. That is what will help you to maintain this deliverance. What also helped me was partly that I had to start saying meditation every single night. I would say, I am loved. I am wanted. I was actually saying this at one point. I bought beats and I was saying it and I was saying, God loves me. I'm loved. I'm wanted. And I started saying positive things, saying, so every time I'd hear a voice, like even after my first deliverance, because it was actually my last deliverance, not the fourth one, the third one, that was when I stopped hearing the voices. But when I used to hear the voices, even after and before the deliverance, I remember I used to, I had beats and I would say, I'm loved. Um, when they're telling me I'm ugly, not I'm beautiful, everything that they were telling me commit suicide. God has not all oh, fear. God has not given me the fear, but of, of fear love. Of power and sound mind. You know, I would say the opposite, but it was hard. But I put in the work. I put in the work as well. So that's what I'll keep stressing is putting in the work. If one is still involved in what, you know, they've been through. Right. If they haven't left it and they're still doing it, it's not there's not going to be deliverance. There's not going to be a change. But it's if the person or people out there put in the work because there's work that needs to be put in. You can't just leave the deliverance just for Pastor Patrick. You can't just leave the work just for the outreach work. But there's an inner work yeah. that we all have. to, And that's what the process of the healing comes yeah. How dangerous did it become then, getting away from the traffickers? Wow, it's been it's been head it's been hell. It's been hell. Um, I remember literally. I I don't even know how to put into words. It's been hell, but it's been mostly hell for the outreach worker, and it's been hell for Pastor Patrick. It's also been hell for myself because, on a spiritual level. I know that they're trying to get me, you know, because how demons work is they try, you know, there's a saying, the battle is fought there, but is won in the heart. Yep. The demons actually play with your mind. If, if they can get through to your mind, then that's a key. And if you accept what is being said in your mind, that's it. You've given them the leeway. Because there's no way that a demon will have access to somebody unless you give them the keys. If you open the door and you leave your door open, what happens? Obviously, a thief will come in. That's how it works. Even the Bible talks about it. Yes. So I'll let Pastor Patrick. That's correct. Uh, he, they will come through harassment. They come through uh, following you everywhere, trying to send, you know, Messages saying people, I, the 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 worst part of it again. When you see these people in a company of uh, uh, force security men, police people, what do you do? Who do you run to? Yeah, that was the the early. Yep. But was they praying the God? Yep. say confusion into their means. Yep. That is just God who shares my. Them. But they has, it, it was hard. But God is harder than them, stronger than them. Because yeah, we're yeah. incredible, because we trust God. Because they thought we were not bringing her out of Christ to want to use her and start getting what they're getting from her. But they'll see a new person, a changed person. You were not looking haggard again. 
No, no, but they, but the, what they depend on their money, they are making through her. But that is not what God, yeah. you don't make yeah. one through people. Yeah. So both, both of you have mentioned this term, breaking the soul tie. What does that mean and how do you break the soul tie? Yeah, breaking the soul tie is like, an example. Like the, the, the first, let me use the, the first man that make love to her. He has a blood covenant. He have to break it. All these people that have slept with her, you see, she said she will feel like wanting more. You hear him voice of Susan, remembering Susan, so person that have an affair with her. Yep. She want to see that person again. The person want to see her again. At times she will move. They will immediately she have in her mind, remembering yeah. them. They will remember her. Either they call her or yes. she call them. Yes. Because the blood has touched the blood that have mixed together. You have to break that link. You don't break it with just shouting or making noise. You have to break it through prayers, through serious prayers, and the deliverance. Blood of Jesus, through deliverance prayer, through the word of God, and then yeah. tell the blood of Jesus and word of God to separate you, break this relationship. It is it's, it's not good. So tie. That's right. Especially if the person is an occultic oh, or demonic, Jesus. is is worse off it's, because it's, it's imagine the energy that they're oh. actually working with. It, it's on a different level because at times I would know it's I actually know that someone's actually thinking of me. The demon, what was this? Will actually tell me that the person is thinking of me. And a lot of the times, I had an ex, one somebody who had actually slept with me, and he did not even, I don't know where he got my number, I changed my number, and he called me. How was he able to call me? He was an occultic. He was into mammy water and everything. So it shows you that if you don't break that soul tie, there's always um, uh, astral, uh, connection. that connection yeah, on an astral yeah. level. Yeah, that, spiritual connection. Yeah. And if the person, whatever emotion that person is feeling, yeah. you're adding that onto your DNA. If that person is a depressed person, you're adding that into. If that yeah. person is an alcoholic, you're adding that into your own, into your own. I would call it aura or energy. And so that's what Pastor Patrick needed to. That's what God wanted to break from me because for me to move on and be my own person, I had to cut that spiritual connection with a lot of those guys because i would probably say i've slept with over 500 men even or know. even more i don't even know i and couldn't tell with you that if the soul tie is not broken and that person's let's say example like her uh, get married to anybody they you still be connected with that person you still be having extramarital activity that's why it's very dangerous yeah. and it, it can break marriage so tie Covenant break marriages, break and that's where King Paimon comes along because that was actually put inside of me as well. I was also dealing incubus, mummy water, and Paimon was all, so any man I slept with, the man, their relationship will always. These are sexual yeah, demons. This is part used by occult men and court women and marine powers. How? long was it between the first deliverance and the second deliverance i think it was months it was um was it three or four months three months was it three months that was because of the distance we would have gone i would have gone straight away because i saw the changes but because of the distance of where the church was and because of the threat that was actually in, um against my life and also against yeah, the outreach um worker. the outreach worker Pastor Patrick could not come to the house to do the delivery needed to take place in the church. So that's why it took three, I think, three months separate. Yeah. What changes were you seeing? I was seeing that I was beginning to remember a lot of the, um, you know, the things that happened to me. My memories was coming back. I was beginning to open up. I felt lighter. My eyes was getting clearer and clearer. But well, even though other demons was manifesting itself, so one was gone, but there was more, which Pastor Patrick, there was more inside that was waiting to come out. And um, I saw a big change. And also as well, I sat up all night talking. So what it was, the outreach worker made me try to break what was inside because every time I'd go to sleep, right, I'm channeling it. 
So I had to, it had to keep me awake. I didn't go to sleep for over seven months straight. And what? she beginning to straight. love us. And she beginning to love us. Straight. And I was beginning to love you straight. Believe me, I felt like I wanted to scream F off. I felt like, I seriously felt like I wanted to tell Pastor Patrick and the, to F off. But you know what? It's because, like I said to you, because I need, I wanted the help. I didn't like what I was, because I felt like I was in spiritual bondage. What I said to Pastor Patrick and what I said to the outreach worker, I felt like I was being chained from my head to the top of my soul with a, a luck. I felt I couldn't move left. I couldn't move right. I couldn't do anything. I was just stuck. If I take, I remember going to, even if I got a job, after three months, I would lose the job. I could never keep a job more than three. What was the key point of three months and three weeks? Partly of the witchcraft that was done on me to make sure that I would not be able to earn any money for myself without having sex. And even if I'd had sex, I'm not supposed to earn money. So a lot of the times I was on job seekers and a lot of the times, even if I went to have work for three weeks, that's it, I'll go straight back on to I could never, who wants to live their life like that? I didn't want to see that for my life. So I wanted the change and I would go places. I'll be walking on the road. Guys would be looking at me like they want to rip off my clothes. It was even the outreach worker spoke to Pastor and went, what is this about? He was even asking me, do you know him? I was like, no. It goes, the man just looked and I would see it like very aggressive it was that bad who wants to live their life like that and women were walking with their husbands a partner and their husbands are looking me down like they want to you know rip my clothes and the woman will be looking at me wanting to kill me and i'm not even dressed provocative i'm actually well dressed that is the spirit in her the demon in her attracting evil people evil men occultic men demonic men what is in her Seeing bad people, the energy, what they call it, energy, like a magnet, it will try to yeah. come, come on, come on, left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. Is that bad? And uh, why it took that long is because of her, the, 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 the genesis, what is in her, it's long. You have a lot of uh, demonization, demonic spirit, law initiation, grooming, and uh, all this uh, 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 so tight. Uh, that's what God is bringing, delivering her. And if anybody that is willing and ready to come out, God will deliver you. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the healing is there for everyone. Sure. God says, here I am. Yeah. Come to me with yeah. outstretched hand. Yeah. It's up to, if the people want, God is there. Yeah. You know, God is omnipresent everywhere. And the thing is, you know, in this age that we're in, Right, God uses people, the spirit of God. You can't just go to any church and give your life and just think that's it. It's not. You have to go through deliverance. If you've been through any of the issues that we've spoken about today, you need to go for deliverance because there is no way out. Not crystals, not new age, no. nothing else. Not. It's just, it's Jesus Christ. That's the only way. How did you measure the progress of the first two deliverances and after the second one, do you think to yourself, we have to do more or do you know when enough is enough? Yes. When, uh, uh, after the first, second deliverance, and then spiritually we'll start assessing her and then we'll know that, look. How do yeah. you assess her? I say somebody, when I start praying with her and then before we run out prayers, you will see the Spirit of God will tell you there are still more, but now, you do delivering with somebody for an hour, 20 minutes, and 15 minutes. You get tired. They, they might, a lot have gone out. You don't want a situation where um, everything will go at the same time. When they come back, it will be terrible. But we'll take it a, a, a step at a time so that the person will be able to withstand it. They shock. Maybe it's not difficult for for God to cast out all the nine or ten demons at the same time. But if they go, they, that person will not be able to withstand it. But when you're taking one step at a time, the, the, the person will now start uh, assimilating, understanding the new life you're about to take, 
And then the Spirit of God that ministering to that person now, you are no more who, who you used to be. You have mm -hmm. changed camp. Mm -hmm. You are not yeah. a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become anew. Gradually, we start seeing it in her. And um, we know when it is uh, God of financially clean out, you see the person, uh, uh, what goal have created that person to be. And you know how I know I've actually changed from my first and my second one, and obviously till now, before I had, I was always afraid. Like I could stay on Facebook and type as much, but I would never talk. I used to just sit there quietly. I could, even when I try to talk, the words is not coming in because the spirit is not allowing me to speak. I, I couldn't talk. And I, I remember I used to start out like just, I couldn't actually talk or my sentences, even when I went to talk, people shut me down. But that was because people that could see spiritually could actually see what was coming through me. And a lot of times when I spoke to people, people put their face down because they couldn't look in my eyes for too long. It was, it, it was just so hip, it was hypnotic. It was unbelievable. How many deliverances did you have? I had three, right, which cleared everything. The fourth one was when John Wedger actually came, and this was this year, which was the soul tie. It was to break the soul tie because I'd, I'd slept with over 500 men all my life. So basically that was to break that connection. So anyone who ever had any pictures of me, because in the past men also had pictures of my vagina, when um, I was drunk, you know, and I had sex, the man would take pictures of my anal. So there was video. So imagine what men are sitting there looking and going at it and thinking, Isabel, at the time I was actually called MM. So, you know, they, they, or Chantel or Foxy. So imagine them sitting there and just, <gasps> you know, and I'm feeling on an astral level because one of the most strongest energy is the sexual energy. Yeah. Going through the deliverances, what was the most intense moments for you physically and mentally? The staying up all night, as well as it, it was in the beginning, it was the staying up all night, the constant threat on a physical and spiritual level that was, I felt at times I started feeling guilty that maybe I should have not told the outreach worker and told Pastor Patrick that because they were going through, especially the outreach worker was going through, I remember threats, threats coming both on a physical level, police level, telling him to back off, you know, she's a prostitute. And um, I even remember him like, yeah, it, harassment, he's getting beat down, punched and kicked by police officers so it was it was that intense you know hit down by a, a car, a car twice. twice hit by a car twice they, they twice. even they even sent the people into the house coming as victims wanting our outreach help but yet they're trying to seduce the outreach worker on top of that some of the people coming in are trying to get him away from me because they don't want me to go through the help. They don't want me to come through my food delivery. It, it they want me bad. back. It was, I could go, I could speak all day on this, but it was that bad. What's the hardest part of the deliverance for you, Pastor Patrick? Uh, the hardest part is when, when you start praying, when like, uh, some of this person demon want to come out, they want to rip you out, they look at it, you want to, you want to, you, are you a human being fear? Fear will catch you want to run as about. If I run, what will be her case? Yeah. I thought yeah. a tiger want to come out will behave like a tiger. <laughs> wow. You see, you see, from the and uh, then another uh, time that will be difficult for her time when we start praying with her, give her anointing on you to drink. When we start praying, even if you didn't give anything, that praying, you start throwing out. Yeah. 
is that true you now? Yeah. Certain things. Uh, yeah. You will see it as saliva, but it's a vomiting serpent. Yeah. For meeting frog. Yeah. For meeting spiders. For meeting like blood. Like, they, blood, blood and some vomiting so, blood. Yeah. I actually at, at vomited a, blood. I remember at some point I was being told by the outreach worker yeah. that I vomited blood. Blood came out. See, uh, you know, ordinary blood, a lot of things. So yeah. that was this. Uh, that, that was a time even vomited, even snake come out. Yeah, but you, you see, I start praying. You don't come out physically. The person will die thinking that, oh, if this is inside me, I'm no more alive. So when you come out, it, it come out of that mouth. When it drop, it drop like a spit, like a, like you know, mook or things like that. But I, I know what. But he can out. see it spiritually. So during all of your deliverances throughout your entire life. Has any of the people you were doing the deliverance on attacked you or done anything else crazy? Oh, the outreach yes. worker. They have several times. There's a one that they will start, they close their eyes and start pushing me around the hall. They will beat me. So, so, that is the demon inside. They're trying to attack mm -hmm. so that you don't uh, pray for them. Or you don't deliver them again. Mm -hmm. Then when I try to hold them, hold them down and start praying, and then the Spirit of God will subdue that spirit. It will go out. The person will can come again. At times they beat you, they tear your body. They don't know what they are doing. Do they I remember get... crying and screaming. I actually, as Pastor Patrick is, I remember crying and screaming. I screamed and I was crying. And then the more I was crying, he turned around. He knew that the spirit was trying to get Pastor Patrick to feel sorry for me so that he will stop. And it's crazy because <laughs> when I used to cry... It's crazy because when I used to cry, the atmosphere will change. Even the outreach worker kept and said, I don't like the spirit because at one time he called Pastor Patrick and said, I can't deal with this no more because the place will go dark, like a very dark energy. So when you start crying, all those demons are walking with that. Come now when people to used to upset me, if I, went, if I literally started crying and focus on them, I had somebody that did me wrong and that really treated me badly that I remembered. When I, when I needed them the most and I focused on them, they had a car crash. So when it's start crying, you know, I know, the demon want pity. So it's that pity that you not come out again with men. Do the people you're doing the deliverance on sometimes get supernatural strength? Ah, thank you for that question. Listen, the, I was doing deliverance with somebody with my uh, second pastor. It is diminutive. I'm, I was taller than him. I was, I, I heard you want to, want to come in, says I want to use a cable like that to the, mid, well, on the split of a second, a, a cable that like, call it run and, and to, I jump from where and held and lifted her up to loosen the tension of the cable on her. Then I call my pastor, come, 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 come help. He said, how? He came and uh, tried to help, no way, I have to lift her. We do uh, remove the cable. I held her down. My pastor came. He kicked her from there and hit the wall. Twice he couldn't go. I was trying to pray with somebody who wrote that me the next thing I did. He lifted me up and hit me on the ground. I fell. I saw stars. <laughs> <laughs> the wife, the wife, the family member, somebody that was insane, that was mad. They brought her from a chain in the, in the church. But when I started praying with him now, he started getting better. He was about to go and attack a, a, a pregnant woman. I heard him praying for him. Because before you know it, he lifted me up and hit me. My star, the wife started crying. Everybody, children start crying. Oh, why would you attack? You know, Pastor Patrick, the only person that is praying for you. But I did not stop. He spat, he spat at me several times so that you not go and pray for them again. I know it's a trick of the devil. I continue. They kick me, they do everything. I continue. They box me. I continue. Before you pray, the more effort the spirit to go, we subdue that demon that we can come again. Yeah. Yeah. What is the longest deliverance you've ever done and why did it take so long? The longest deliverance I've done and why it takes long is the, the deliverance of the outreach worker. Wow. That God used to bring. Wow. Yeah. Oh God. The type of Demons Bilal, he was dealing with. He could channel Bilal himself, and, and, which is Bell. He could actually channel and, that. Could you explain Bilal? Bilal is when going back. I spoke about Bell, but in the world they use him, politicians, and they rule. They're, they're the ones he deals with. 
people in the higher ranking and he could actually channel because I literally, when he told me, I thought, wow, I actually being possessed. I know Bilal's spirit, so I don't. It's a I demon don't like his yeah, he's in total into love. And uh, he claims to be uh, the demon of fertility. It's wrong. All abortion is being controlled by demon of Baal. And Baal is ancient Egyptian god. Bilal. Yeah, yeah, that was brought into e e Israel through Jezebel. From the husband of Ahab that married Jezebel. Yes. Jezebel was the daughter of the king of Egypt. So a pharaoh of Egypt come into his brought the God and made Ahab to start worshiping him. All Israel worship. Remember the contest in in, in the book of First King chapter 17 and 18, where Elijah had to call down fire to consume sacrifice where 450 prophets of Baal were defeated. So that we are standing upon that defeat on Mount Carmel to defeat every Baal that comes from it. But in the process, you, do you see where Baal, actually Bilal, actually also got what he wanted, which was blood, the death. So he, he actually he actually thrives through the blood. Where there is death, where there is actually blood, that's where he lies. So when... When Elijah had consumed the prophets of Jezebel, he still, even though they were dead, yeah, he still he still gained blood, the yeah. death of the 400 prophets. So with him, he will give, but he will still turn against you. Is the spirit he that controls emotions? He turns, emotion. yeah. He turns. How long between your second and third deliverance? How long, how many days? That was months again because of the distance, and also Pastor Patrick and the um and the outreach worker had to sort of monitor my progress to see where I needed to be delivered, and for myself as well, I was eager to want to go. So I think once again four months. So it took the first one I believe was three or four months, and then the second one I believe was three or four months, and then the third one. So it was it was sort of months in between each deliverance. And after you do each one then, what cumulative gains are you feeling after the third one? Are you thinking, I'm nearly, you know, this is all nearly gone by now, or are you still thinking there's still work to do? I know when they still works to, when there was still works to do because... I'm still hearing the demons. They're still talking to me. They're saying, these people don't want to help you. They don't like you. They're just trying to use you. So it's like, that's when I knew. Until I stopped hearing the voices, like literally it talking to me, I knew it was still there. And as well, I could still hear the voices of the men that I'd slept with. I could, even at night, at some point, I was actually beginning to call the men's names. I remember the outreach worker was sleeping in the front room and I was in the bedroom and I was actually screaming out loud. He actually literally just opened the door and went, are you okay? Because I was literally, I was actually screaming men's name. I remember even at some time masturbating over a man. I remember having a dream and calling their names and it was different at one point I even called the man's name who had done the um who had actually um the pedophile in the block I actually called his name and I was masturbating over him this was after my first second deliverance yeah so after the third one then you said the fourth one was the cutting of the soul tie yeah how much period of time was in between those two the 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 third one, I believe, was also three months. Was it three months, Pastor Patrick? Yeah. I believe it was. Was it three months yeah. or four months? Yeah, but two, then two and three. Uh, yeah, two or three months was the third one. Then that was when everything started subsiding. Like I couldn't hear the voices anymore. I felt like my mind was calm. Then that's when I knew it worked and then I stopped having the dreams I felt lighter in my spirit I felt like I was ready I was now I even said to the outreach worker I'm an open vessel now I'm ready to start receiving and he started and the outreach worker said to me okay right start 
He started, we started praying together. I was so eager to want to help people myself because before I wasn't eager into helping people. I used to feel like everyone hated me. I wanted to help. I was like, I want to help women. I want to help little children. And I felt like I wanted to start um, some kind of charity to help people. I want to sort of talk because there's a lot of young people you know, out there who are suffering in silence. And I think in the age that we're in, a lot of young people can't relate to people unless you've gone through the experiences. So I felt like I had the experience enough to be able to help, you know, young girls out there, even if it comes to going in with the wrong crowds to do with, um, you know, going out on the streets. I've also been out on the street. So I know what it's like. So I really, I was very eager wanting to help people. Yeah, so that was when I knew that. So did you wait months then before the cutting of the soul tie one? I waited, I believe it was seven months. Was seven, it seven months? So was it seven months or six months? Because it was actually this year. So it was, it was this year when John actually, when we did one of the deliverance. Um, and then because John, at which John will speak upon it when he's ready. He actually did his deliverance as well. And when Pastor Patrick was praying for everyone, he realized the spirit of God spoke to him. And then he he prayed for the soul tie, cutting of the soul tie. And once again, I fell on the floor and I, I was just like, boom. And I thought, oh God, here we go again. But I knew that that was... Because actually, I'd actually known that I wanted to cut soul ties because I used to see visions of somebody that I thought who was going to marry me in America before I met the outreach worker. And um, the guy, I saw a vision of the guy going to somewhere in North Carolina and, and holding my picture and just masturbating by the tree. I actually saw a vision of him and I spoke to the outreach worker and... Um, Pastor Patrick, I didn't tell Pastor Patrick, he picked up on the soul tie and then he went, he just broke that off straight so away. So when you cut the soul tie, is that a different procedure that you have to do? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it is simple, but another level. It's another level. Yeah, another level. Or higher than what we've done before. And why it took that long is at times we were prepared to invite her to come for prayers or for deliverance rather, we notice there are a lot of people monitoring her to attack, even in cars around her places, following. Yes. So when we notice that the, the situation around her is not, uh, we uh, don't go out, stay. Yeah. We start praying over the, on the, on the yeah. phone. That is why it took this long. Because her case is a special case. Many people on top are interested in her case. Yeah. For her not to be delivered, so that was why it took this long. Yeah, a, yeah, a, a, you know, a convenient time when she will not be physically attacked, and the and the and the work uh, work uh, work not to uh, be also physically attacked. That is when it dragged her. When we pray, see that there are no people monitor physically. There will come some people around. Her, yeah, my third, her. my third delivering the one that was supposed to take me to Dubai, the the one that had a, prost uh, a prostitute house that had basically um, a, a business in the area. He was actually in the car, and I went, and he drove where he was. He shouldn't have driven that way because those that side is for the buses, and he actually drove slowly, looked at me, and I was actually going to get my deliverance, and he looked at me. Right, in, in other to say, and then I just turned away and I was like, blood of Jesus. And then he drove and then he drove back again. And I thought, you're going to have a ticket, but keep doing it. But then I went. But yeah, so it was it was every time I've had to go to my for my deliverance, like Pastor Patrick has said, there's always been some kind of obstacle. There's always been something trying to stop me from doing well, it. Oh, God, I've been watching. Yeah. God is faithful. Yeah. God is very faithful. I had people threatening to throw acid on my face. What? And even even the um, outreach worker as well. I had people threatening to kill me. Oh, yes. It, it's been going. There's been, it's been a whole lot of 
drama and if the outreach worker wasn't a courageous person someone who's quite bold and courageous and loves god i don't think i think most people would have ran yeah. what he had encountered so how did you feel after the cutting of the soul tie i couldn't see nobody doing anything it's just i felt like i'm me sure. i felt like i was me i felt like Sorry. I felt like I was, I felt like I was me again. I felt like I'm free. I felt like I'm ready now to take on the world. Unlike before, I was not ready. I was very fearful. I was very, people could easily intimidate me. I was very vulnerable. I was in a place of vulnerability. I was in a place of vulnerability. And I'm sorry, that's the outreach worker trying <laughs> knows, to check up. He knows we're talking about me. him. <laughs> so just to make sure I'm safe, as usual. Mm -hmm. So um, I was in a place of vulnerability, very always intimidated. Um, I was very fearful. There was even a time, even before my deliverance, where times I'll be afraid to go out on the road. I I, I didn't want to face the world. Sometimes I'll close myself in for a week, even before I ever met the outreach work and Pastor Patrick, I'll close myself in. If I had to go, I'm just going out either just to get um, my J sign for my JSA, get my drugs and go straight back in. So it was, yeah, I, I was afraid of everything. Before. Very always anxious, always very, any little noise would get me to shake. I was, yeah. Pastor Patrick, how do you know when the job is done? Oh, when the job is done, you can see, the, when you look at that person, you can see the real person in that person. Oh, yeah, you can, if he loving the things of God and feeling free, he's not afraid again. You know, like, when you look at the eyes, you see the eyes of a human being. Yeah. You know, in the eyes of Def uh, definitely. different, different movement inside the eyes. Yeah. And, uh, the, the person, when you talk to the person here and he tell you the mm -hmm. truth, he asks a question, he tell you the truth. And when you pray, you can see him connecting to when prayer is going on. And some of them, when they are not delivered, when prayer is going on, they want to distract you, want to yeah. tell you hundred words. They want to do things to irritate you so that uh, they will not concentrate, so that the prayer will not affect them. But when I see her, she was a new person lovely and i used to cross girl. my legs yeah. there's a thing about crossing my yeah. legs that if you cross the legs it cannot penetrate through it's a form of not letting energy that's during the yeah, so i used to like to yeah. cross my legs and the demons now i'm make just it like so that the prayer like a way of countering the prayers yeah yeah but we know that you know how to yeah. deal with it and what year was that severing of the soul what 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 um ties what year did you do that one the soul tie last one yeah the last one was 2000 this year 2020 um i believe it was when april march what, what, was it was it march so march of 21 or 20 two, oh 2021 i'm so sorry it's just last month just then. literally last month just last I month believe. yeah it was last month I believe. have you had to relocate away from bad people i've had to i've had to change my number twice the first time I changed my number, the guy who was trying to take me to Saudi Arabia, you know, near my house, he contacted me. He has access to certain devices that can sort of um, link my, can sort of link my number, basically get my number. They run a very dodgy business, let me put it that way. And um, obviously the police are backing them up. So they have bent police and all of that. So um, there, I've had to change my number, I think, is it twice or three times? This is actually my second, I believe, third number. And so, remain in house arrest. And I've had, I've stopped. Stay I've, indoors, not to go out for, for some months. I've caught, so to, I've caught all, all of the people I knew before. I'm not talking to them. And I'm not on Facebook. I've actually shut down my Facebook account and 
all. The only thing that I'm on is um, WhatsApp, which is obviously um, outreach, the outreach work we're doing and Pastor Patrick and the outreach worker. I no longer speak to my mother. I no longer speak to my, um, because I no longer speak to my step ex stepfather. And I don't speak to none of my family members. Uh, basically, my family is the pillar of fire. Pastor Patrick, Jesus fire. Christ, fire. Jesus Hallelujah. Christ, the greatest fire, fire. father of all, which is God yeah, Almighty. Bro, so so bro, that's that, that. That's the one that can always cover me in His pavilion, you know, and um, from any danger coming near me. And also the outreach worker, they show me love all the time. And Mummy, which is his wife, you know, Pastor Patrick's wife, who I call Mummy. She shows me a lot of support and um, Pastor Patrick shows me a lot of support, outreach. They, they've been brilliant. So I've never felt much love in my life. This is actually the first time that I've ever felt mm -hmm. anyone ever mm -hmm. cared what, about me. So thank you um, to Pillar of Fire and thank God. What was your last communication with your mum? I actually have it on my phone here. Um, my last communication was, I told her everything that I'd gone through. She said she was aware of the guy in the estate that um, when it was reported, the police um, the police sort of dropped the charges. I said to her, can you tell this to the police, to the police officer who was dealing with the case? She said, yes, she will. I sent the information to the police officer who was investigating my case and she turned around, she refused. She said her exact words was, I don't want to get involved in this case and I have nothing to say and my daughter is telling lies. Oh. And are these uh, traffickers, they have a lot of money to corrupt the police and the government? Sorry, one, just one more thing. She even turned around and said that if she said to the outreach worker right in front of me, if only I would tell the truth and say that I liked having sex, that then my life will be better after I told her what had happened. Mm. So she's made it clear. She's chosen her side to keep silence and to stick with her ex-husband, you know, and mm. all the people she's been dealing with. So that's absolutely fine. So I know where I stand with her. Hey, let me come in here. You said the last um, communication I have with her mother, after her deliverance, Right. She says she don't. She felt truly not love, but the God showed her love, as she have just said. Now, through serious prayer and counseling, and a lot of things, the outreach worker and myself, yes. it took time. Was able I and that worker all arrange for a meeting, a settlement, a reconciliation between her and the mother. Last year. Which the mother started coming to the church. He said, What happened to you? They told her, Yes, I was able to get deliverance through Susan so Quick Church. They told her, Pillow of Fire Ministry, where the mother came to the church. Mm -hmm. And she was actually came to complain about the outreach worker right. and the daughter. After right. getting that, I said, Okay, after praying for her. I know about it. I pray, pray for her for some time. Then after her complete deliverance. Yeah. For for a complete to be finalized, I want you need to reconcile with your mother. There is need, need a mother blessing, please. She refused because of the experience she had. We don't want to go into that. But after through prayer and persuasions and talking to her, she mm -hmm. through the word of God, she accepted. Actually, I think it last year. Yeah? Yes, yeah. it was last year. I invited her mother to the church in Dagenham. Seventy were born in South. She she came. And we sat with my wife. And I said, after the service, she was having, we prayed and told her, look, your daughter have experienced certain things. You have experienced certain things. We don't want to go into, you do me, I do you, this. No. But now, God has delivered your daughter. And God is delivering you also. We want peace. Yeah, right. Okay? Sorry. And you, for, uh, is Isabel, tell your mother you're forgiving her. Mom, Tell your daughter you've forgiven her so that you can be in peace. She and didn't say, I forgive you. She made, I said, 
I said sorry to her for something that she's done to me, which is this is what she's always done in the past. When I go to talk to her, she does this crying thing where I can't express what I'm feeling as a daughter. So I have to push back my own emotions and just say, I'm sorry for coming to you. So in the church, she refused, sorry, Pastor Patrick, she refused to apologize to say to the experiences that I've been through that she wasn't there to protect me. And then, but she accepted, I said, sorry for anything that I may have done to you. Do you know what? She didn't even apologize. And that was it. And she gave me a hug. I took the hug knowing that, as knowing it didn't come from the heart, knowing that she wasn't a changed woman. And I left it there. And since then, it's been, we haven't spoken. She doesn't want to help. She doesn't. So I'm like, okay, no problem. I know where you stand. You obviously, I, I said to her, I know that you don't like me. I even said to her, okay, please help me find my father, right? Because my siblings have access to their father. She's She says she's not helping me. And the issue she has with me partly is because my father, when she met my father, in Nigeria, my father was a millionaire at the time, but my father, she was, her parents died and she wanted a rich man to take care of her. When my father got her pregnant with me, she, he didn't want to know. And she resents me for that because mm. my father did not want to be with her. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of hatred. So you hate me because of the actions that my father did. Mm. What a mother, eh? So, we're almost we're almost at the end of the time now. Um, so if somebody was going through hell and they needed a deliverance, could they contact you? Yes. Anybody that if you are being trafficked in the past or in the present, feeling uh, demonic activities, your cultic activities, marine or witchcraft, uh, they've done or you know ritual or beer or. You know, we doctors are troubling you, having spiritual. Yeah, you come to us, come to Pillar of Fire Ministry. Fire! Fire, fire, fire. fire. Pillar of Fire, go. Can we say that fire again? Fire! 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 Come, the God of Fire will deliver you wherever you are. You know, we don't. It, 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 it's, Freely, we are, uh, the gift is given and freely. We don't charge money. Yes. So do we charge money for you? No, no. So we, we don't, don't charge money. In fact, Pastor Patrick helps me out every time I need help. I've never once needed anything. And I've said, Pastor Patrick, I need this. He will gladly just send into my account. And I can always show proof. And we're going to so. have contact details and links for Pastor Patrick in the description box we'll also have john wedge's links in the description box what do you say to any women watching this or girls watching this who may be being trafficked or going through drug issues and abuse sexual please, abuse please please do speak up please the only way that you can help yourself your mental state of mind is to speak up you need to come out you need to ask for help if you do not ask for help then you cannot get the help that you want you must speak up the only way it can be done is you coming forward speaking up and seeking for help we're always here i know what you're going through whether it's actually a whether, whether it's a sexual ritual whether it's actually you know a voodoo thing obr whatever it is I understand because I've been there. I'm 35 years of age. I've been I've been going through this for 32 years, 32 years plus. Imagine the trauma that I've been through. I know what it's like to want to commit suicide. I know what it's like to be hated. I know what it's like where you have an addiction and you can't help. Come out and speak up, please. Whether you're a boy, whether you're a girl, especially those from respectable families especially those a lot of sexual abuse i must i must stress actually starts from home i'm not saying it's everyone but a lot of it always comes from the inside because even if it's done on the outside it's always those within the family those very people that you know that will actually sell you out in other for money and for stuff and for witchcraft please do speak up 
That is my message. Yeah, I want to know to ask again, the witchcraft or trafficking or um, sexual perversion, all this thing, it is not African thing alone. It is it's, it's in Europe. We have yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And I was praying with a, a sister the other day. I got home. I told her, look, there are a lot of witchcraft activity against about it. Occult men are following. She said, he go home, she says, so blood, physical blood on her doorstep, on her handle, not once, not twice. He will follow her. So it is not black thing, yes. it is general. Yes. Oh, which, uh, white or black or yellow or green people can be demonized. Yes. Whatever you're passing through, come, God will deliver you in Jesus' name. Yes. The, what I was just stressing out is that black, a lot of black people, a lot of black um, a, a victims is due to oh you know don't bring shame to the fam yes. a lot of their mouths are their lips are tight please that's what that's what i was saying i'm not saying it doesn't happen to every other race but i'm just saying they people they're actually a lot of black victims that you're scared out of shame and guilt you feel that you don't want to speak up because you do not want to shame the, your family. Your family is not the one going through the trauma that you're going through. It's not, not your family that is living in bondage, that is living in fear and suicidal. It's you. And if you want to help yourself and you don't want to see yourself in that situation, speak up. And I also encourage other race to come forth. Everyone just come forth because... The demons, this is what they use. They like victims. When once you're a victim, right, that is the key. That's that's the key way of giving them access to possession and for your life to just go terminal. So please do come forward. Thank you very much, guys and John. Shall we finish with a prayer, Pastor Patrick? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, we want to pray now. And um, yes, as we go into prayers, anything you're suffering, get get in touch with us and god will help you yes we freely giving we don't charge money but if you want to support what god is doing is allowed let us pray father in the name of jesus amen amen father in the mighty name of jesus amen oh god we thank you for uh the message we have shared and we are passed on oh god we pray everyone hearing this message that is passing through one issue or the other. Holy Spirit, deliver them by fire in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh God, my Father, nobody will die because of demonization or witchcraft or trafficking. In the name of Jesus, deliver your children in the name of Jesus. Amen. I pray in the name of Father, bless Sean and uh, his organization in the name of Jesus. The Lord bless protect you. The Lord provide for you in the name of Jesus. I pray for Isabel. The Lord continue to protect you. The pray for John Weja, the Artur Walker. The Lord bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Anyone hearing and watching this program, whatever you are passing through does not of God. I pray the God that created heaven and earth we deliver you in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord prosper you. As you watch, God bless you. You will not be attacked in Jesus' name. Amen. God, we shall fire right now. Fire! Fire! Yeah. fire. Woo! Woo! Glory be to God. Amen. Thanks, thank guys. You, well you, done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Fire! 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 Fire!